Greg, stop floss dancing in front of your Yu-Gi-Oh cards. The mayor called. He's got a special project for us. Does he want us to solve the housing crisis since we're so informed? No, it's more important. We've got to come up with a nickname for Los Angeles. Well, easy peasy lemon squeezy. It's La La Land. Well, that's more of a moniker. Mm, okay. Obviously, then, Surf City. No, that's an alias. How about Sleepy Hollow? That's a pseudonym that's taken, and there's also a story about the Headless Horseman, which in itself is a moniker, so still no. Let's not take any more stupid ideas from literature. Let's call a city Mark Twain. That's a gnome de plume. The only possible nickname for Los Angeles is 007. Well, sir, that's a call sign given by MI6 for their randiest field operative, so again, no. Well, then, how about lunch sometime? That is a call to human resources, and don't make me turn you down again. How about this? Los Angeles. Hypertension, the silent killer. That's a condition. And a moniker. How about we call it Pajama Party? My house, no rules. I'm calling HR. You tease. You know what? The nickname? Right in front of our faces. So obvious. Oh my god, of course. It's in the name. Okay, well, let's get the mayor in here. Sarah, get the mayor in here. Of Los Angeles. Where do I keep her around? Oh, yeah, the tapes. Mayor, we've got it. The new nickname of the city, Los Angeles. The big, windy, easy city that never nicknames. Who are these guys? The police! The mayor called the cops on us! He called the pigs in here? The screws! The poison blue! Now they're putting us in handcuffs? Houdini bracelets? Get those clinkers off me, I don't need no darbies on my wrists. Oh, so you're kneeling us down execution style and now you're bringing out the guns, eh? What are you gonna do with that hand cannon, that gut, that pea shooter? <laughs> and what, now you're gonna pistol whip us, the old- Greg, 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 wake up! Mm -mm. They're digging our graves! How close to death did you get? Pretty close. Then you must have seen what I saw. A lake of flames? No, 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 no. Before that, before they realized who we were, it was a city filled with winged religious creatures. You mean those floss-dancing cherubs? No, no, the other ones. They were angels. It was a city full of them. I think I have the perfect nickname for Los Angeles. Duh. And it only took a near-death experience at the hands of the mayor of the city. Mayor, we're still alive, and I think we may have what you're looking for. The the new nickname of Los Angeles, Bean Town. Nah, that's a moniker. <laughs>
I love art. And, I really do love felt. No one's ever questioned that. I love arts and craft stuff. My girlfriend described it to me, and I thought it was going to be like one item, but it's like mm-hmm. a well-stocked yeah, yeah. market. So you could buy anything, You could right? buy, So yeah. then as the days go on, There's you less. know, the, it's it, it's like a hurricane's coming, and everyone, exactly. we can't get resupply. Everyone is packing their felt grocery cart yeah. with felt water <laughs> and, they're and batteries. Fighting, yeah, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're fighting each other. My oh. baby! <laughs> I need these felt power bars. <laughs> My felt baby is suffocating! <laughs> I wanted to go to that, but wasn't the stuff it was kind of expensive well not the to stuff go in, was, but the yeah, stuff the was stuff expensive. was expensive it was nice to just be there cute, I, though. I bought yeah, a little thing I bought a thing for a friend was it me yeah <laughs> I didn't see pictures before I went so hearing about it when I, I thought it was going to be one thing yeah that wasn't impressive and I went there I'm like oh this is actually quite impressive well when you told me you said I'm at a felt market I, I said they have a whole market just to sell felt because I knew that you were looking for felt unrelated well unrelated, unrelated but unrelated to this yeah and then you sent me a picture of some stuff and I was like oh so the market that sells loose felt also has these cool little creations but there's a felt market <laughs> yeah. you just buy felt there <laughs> can I, how many how many rolls of this can I get how many rolls of smiley strawberry can I get but yeah yeah, it looked cool. I wish it's I had gone cool, to yeah. that. And yeah. It's all sold out now. Yeah, and I think and the exhibit's <laughs> over now, so I shouldn't be talking about it. But I'll tell you something that I did do this month that always going to be there. I made a beautiful visit to Hollywood <laughs> Toe. Here we go. I made a such a necessary trip to Hollywood Toe. I parked on Ivar and Yucca near the Knickerbocker, and I was towed from that spot. Not 10 feet from me was a place how, where how much I could... longer after you parked? I want to say four to five minutes after I parked, yeah. I was towed. Well, because we were meeting at the same place, yeah. and we were coming from a different place, and you you were like, I got a spot. I'm already there. Yeah. And I was like, how did you get a spot so quick? I said, I hope it gets towed. But there, <laughs> and I called the tow truck. I said, look for this car. It was a whole uh, Waylon Jennings, Richie Valens <laughs> situation. It wasn't Richie Valens. It was Buddy Holly. I'd parked on that street a lot, but I always park a little closer to Hollywood. And I thought, well, I just found the first spot that I, and you know, it was a street that I park on all the time. Yeah. I'm really surprised because you're all, usually like whenever we park somewhere together, you're making sure the parking is okay. I'm very surprised. I'm, uh, I'm frankly, I'm disappointed. I in mean, you. I, it's my fault because I got used to the habit of parking on this street mm-hmm. and having no problem and I park late on that street and it's not a problem but I don't park on this particular space which is this space maybe the space behind me had a no tow thing above you can park you know two hour parking eight to six I didn't see an additional sign say oh after yeah. that we're gonna tow you a lot of those signs in Hollywood are like it's almost like turning the page in a book it's like no parking six to eight also no parking eight to six, six exactly. if you look at the one yeah. after it it helps when they're on the same sheet on the same yeah square. it does but obviously they they don't want to help you with that. That's why I don't don't get towed in Hollywood because I don't want them to make money more. If you're if you're trying to find parking in Hollywood, don't park on Yucca and Ivar, okay? And don't give them the <laughs> money. An official LA Meekly boycott of Yucca and Ivar. I want Hollywood Tow to be burned to the ground. <laughs> Call to action. <laughs> but um, through bankruptcy. Uh, nothing <laughs> financially no burned flames to the ground. or no one getting hurt. So hey, send us your stories of getting towed in Los Angeles. Was, love, it, was it as romantic as Greg's was? At the tow place they had pictures when you're in the waiting area. <laughs> Famous people getting towed. They had uh, <laughs> <laughs> Clark Gable getting towed. Uh, they had pictures of like Hollywood landmarks, and I thought nobody wants this. They're trying, trying to, to make it into a tourist you, destination. It, I, exactly. What are you, are you trying to make it appealing? No one, no one is here that wants to be here. We have eight of Ashton Kutcher's cars. Ah, if you want to come look, uh, just sit, you could sit in it for it's a thousand dollars. You could sit in Ashton it, Kutcher's car. It's cheaper for him to just buy a new one. <laughs> well, my thing, uh, I went to the Garvey Ranch Park Observatory in Monterey Park as part of the Los Angeles Astronaut. Astronomical Society every Wednesday night in Monterey Park at this observatory they meet. I went there because they had come to where I work a few years ago and I had a, I, I, my dog broke my telescope as I told my professor, <laughs> my professor so many times. So many times. And it, it's been broken for like four years and when they came in to the to where I work like three years ago I was like hey my telescope is broken can you fix it? And they, they said they gave me a wedgie. <laughs> they stuck me in the locker. And they said they were not that, they were not those sorts of dorks. <laughs> uh, You're looking for repairman dorks. <laughs> and they said yeah just bring it in and we can do it for free. Uh, in my mind, they said free. And then, so th- <laughs> three years later, I finally go there and I was like, hey, do you remember me? They said no. And uh, then, three years ago, you said you'd do this for free. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, it's, it's in writing. I wrote it down. <laughs> they didn't quite fix it there, but they said just flip this over, buy this, and screw this in, and it works. It, you have a it works. Telescope. I have a working telescope. You can now see Nibiru or whatever planet yeah. crazy people think yeah, is Nibiru. Kill us. Other than uh, giving me free repairs. Yeah. You know, it's an observatory, so they had, you know, you go up in the observatory and you look in the telescope and yeah. it's all these old, like, not old, well, not old, yeah. uh, retired JPL nerds just oh, like cool. bickering with each That's other fun. and they're like, no, no, you can't find Mars by going up to <laughs> Venus. And, <laughs> and they're like debating, like, I can find, I know how to star hop, I can navigate 
relate to this on my own. But they're... your people, don't 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 mock them. These are your <laughs> people. These are this is your clan. <laughs> it comes out of a place of love and fear. <laughs> well, you know, they showed us the moon. They showed us Saturn. They showed us. It's a really nice. They showed us Did they Jupiter. Threaten to uh, show us Uranus. Show us Uranus. Uh, Speaking of Uranus, also it... send you to the moon. <laughs> One of these days, Daniel. Bang, zoom, I'm going to show you my anus. <laughs> but it really, speaking of your anus, the park smelled like dog doo-doo. Yeah, dropping is a, <laughs> dog an adult scat. way to say it. But yeah, they, they showed us the stuff. It, they were all really friendly. Obviously, they helped me out. It's free. You can go look at stuff. And people, sh- you know, people, because it's a big park and people are like playing baseball and stuff. And then they come in like, yeah, I want to see Venus. That's cool. And it was nice. And they had, uh, what? No, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to ask a directional question. So go ahead. Oh, it's north. And then they had kids there. Um... And people were protesting, and I'm like, how much is a kid? You can bring your kid there, and basically, you can make your own telescope with them, and that oh, cool. involves, like, you get this, they all have these, like, circular discs of, I don't know, some sort of plastic. To make a telescope, you have to polish these against this stone for 40 hours, mm-hmm. so it's just, like, all these kids rubbing these pieces of, like, <laughs> round plastic against these polishing stones. That's pretty cool. It was bizarre, but... Yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah. it's a cult. It's a cult yeah. of star worshippers. <laughs> I, try, I, I tried snapping them out out of it nah. they try to bite my fingers <laughs> they threw snakes in my mailbox yeah yeah you told me that you were going and i i called you nerd and you went and i called you nerd and then you told me how fun it was and i thought i want to be i want that life because they're the people that also do the star parties at, at at, sorry <laughs> uh, i keep thinking it's a telescope and i'm pointing my finger everywhere that's my star gun they're the ones that do the star party <laughs> and now I'm pointing, I'm pointing from above <laughs> down at you. They're the ones that do the star parties at Griffith, Griffith Observatory. Observatory. Oh, I went to one of those. Yeah, I, I know. can't remember if I went recently or You not. did. You went when Mars was really close. Oh, that's when I went. Yeah, yeah. Mars parking ahead. Uh, we didn't make us <laughs> did walk. Did you say Mars parking ahead? Yeah, there was a big sign that said Mars parking ahead, and it made me laugh so much, and I put it on our Instagram stories, really? and people were like, mm, they didn't say anything. Uh, <laughs> well, in space, no one can hear you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we had a walk up from the Greek, and it was a long walk. Uh, I brought wine, and I drank most of the wine, and then I had to walk down. Yeah. Yeah, those things are fun. Yeah, I've always wanted to go to one, but exactly that. I've always wanted to go to one, you know, a planet, (laughs) but it always just seemed like a hassle to to get up there. I have a telescope now. I don't know. Every night's a star party at my house. I could check the parking at Griffith Observatory with my telescope. (laughs) I had a fantasy of us going night hiking and bringing Mm. your telescope, and then I thought, I don't want to go night hiking. (laughs) And then I thought, I'm out of shape. What? Let's move on to our uh, reader question, reader, or listener question. No, 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 they don't listen either. People who ask questions when we ask them to ask questions of the month. People who follow us on social media, question of the month. <laughs> so this month's question, it comes from Joel Samataro. So he asks, can you tell me, a very aggressive question, if I may, <laughs> can you tell me why the LA Flight Path Museum exists? Because when he asked that, I thought like, what I imagined was one of those maps that shows like Southwest flies to all these yeah. cities and it's just like a map of yeah. routes that's and that's what the plane. museum is. Yeah. yeah, But it's not that. It's I looked into it. I had never heard I of it. I had never heard of it either. Yeah. But yeah, Thank I looked, you for bringing uh, it up to us because we ha- there's so many museums that are so small and they yeah. get by you and I'm getting more and more interested yeah. in these And the reason they get things. by you is because people want to know about them by asking why does it exist? <laughs> <laughs> it opened in 2003. Uh-huh. It's at the South part of LAX. It's you, not in LAX. You said it was closer to... Uh, it's in uh, El Segundo. Right. It's kind of near the like downtown El Segundo area, but it, it's just a little thing. I don't know if you have to pay to get in it or not, but it has like, from what I saw, like old stewardess uniforms from like TWA and Pan Am and Killer. stuff, and they have like old luggage things with like I've been to Morocco and all yeah. these stickers all over it, and like then that. just like sort of memorabilia and paraphernalia of these old de- defunct, I almost said debunked. <laughs> TWA never have. TWA was an inside job. We all know <laughs> the flight isn't real right <laughs> man flying not real it's an effects of chemtrails <laughs> you're hallucinating because of chemtrails Trails, which don't actually, exist you see a bird chemtrails plane that's what happens is uh, that a bird is a plane no it's a chemtrail <laughs> but yeah it, it just seems like a uh, cool old airport memorabilia which yeah. sounds interesting and i, I want to go there yeah i don't know why it exists but i'm happy it does yeah, like, i don't know I, why I feel... why is anything i mean what's the real the real question is here why does anything exist <laughs> how did we get eyeballs i mean how long did it take evolutionary for us to be able to see something well god was like oh, well, i don't know they're bucking it, they're rubbing into stuff i went to the museum of jurassic technology and although i enjoyed it i'm like what am i doing here why is this a thing <laughs> but i enjoyed it though and i enjoy the idea of like historical 
historical myths having a spot. But still. But why why is LACMA there? What are, what are we trying to recapture the past? Move on, everybody. Here's a flight path of the future. <laughs> it's, it's there because it's a museum capturing. I mean, flight is a big part of the yeah. city. I don't know. It sounds like a cool museum. It does sound like a cool museum. Yeah. We should go. We should go right now. Oh, my God. Pause it. <gasps> oh, I got to buy a plane ticket. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have to buy round trip yeah. tickets to be able to <laughs> go to this fly. museum. People don't know that. There's the answer to your snarky question. If anyone else has a question uh, they want us answered about LA history, why art exists, what is the very nature of reality, how do we run this podcast, Uh, why do we run this podcast, send us a question on Instagram, LA underscore meekly, email it. Uh, I almost gave out my personal email. Do it. Big butt 6969, big butt. Vert skater, uh, surfboard, chocolate bar at... Not far off. (laughs) (laughs) At (laughs) hotfudgesunday.net. At Daniel.me. Uh, LA, what is it? What is LA, it? LA. Meekly at gmail.com is our email. Feel yeah. free to email us any questions and stuff. Yeah, any way that you can come in contact with us, yeah. uh, just let us know. Yeah. Tattoo you want- it on your body and stand on top of a big, 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 big. If you want to do something where Daniel can only see it by telescope and you leave a message for him in his apartment <laughs> complex and he sees it, and then like after three years, he finally uses his telescope, which he had to repair one more time. Yeah. <laughs> because now it. I ran into it and yeah. it broke. Turns out I'm the dog. Your dog. Woof. I didn't enjoy that at all. Not not even a l- yeah, a little bit. Okay, I take it back. It grows <laughs> over time. So like yeah, a fungus. That's uh, shut up. That's been uh, old fungus. That's, <laughs> <laughs> and that's our first nickname of the night. <laughs> that was last month. Now let's get into September. This Hit month we're going to be talking about nicknames, famous nicknames in Los Angeles. Did you ever have a nickname? Uh, yeah, I did actually. High school, it was Eric Foreman. You guess why? Like From they, that '70s show. Yeah, they thought I looked like Eric Foreman, so everyone called me Foreman. Which one was Eric Foreman? Was he David Duke? Wh- which one was? Yeah, it? it's David Duke. <laughs> David <laughs> Duke. Yeah, it's David Duke. It took me a minute. Like what? Topher Grace. Topher Grace. Yeah, yeah. I had hair was similar to Eric Foreman in high school. Okay. Now I have no hair. <laughs> You've turned into Eric Foreman's dad. <laughs> His name's Red. In elementary school, it was Waffles. Why? Greg sounds like Ego, then it <laughs> let go of my Grego, then it led to <laughs> Waffles. I have a, a signature book from leaving, uh, or autograph book from elementary and everything that says Waffles on it. <laughs> Everything's coming up waffles. It's more of a moniker, really. <laughs> Do you have a nickname? Well, you know my one nickname from when I was younger, when I used to play baseball. Remind me? RBI. RBI was yeah, that. they called yeah. me RBI. Because all I could do was hit RBIs when I played <laughs> baseball. I couldn't catch anything. I could not hit any other kind of hit. I could only hit RBIs. You could only score runs in. You know, that's probably my greatest sports moment is like, I remember hitting, because I was RBI, and they yeah. were, I think they were saying like, RBI, RBI, and oh, I hit an RBI, so and people were like applauding. That's great. Yeah. That is your, uh, your moment. Rudy moment. That is your Rudy moment. That's your moment in Sandlot when he finally like catches the ball. Yeah, and that's how I became an announcer for the LA Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> so those are our nicknames. Yeah, those, yeah. Uh, send us your nicknames. Uh, Joel, I get towed a lot. Samataro. That's good. He's probably never been told before. Uh, never been told. I, I like toad. to think that I've never been towed, but if I did, I would pass. <laughs> These are going to be some famous people from LA history. Not that famous though. They're kind of uh, obscure people, really. Mine. Yeah. I mean, they were pretty big figures in their time. In their time but they've kind of been forgotten all right so my first one some men are men of the cloth Christ. But for some of those men, that cloth is wound up really tight around their fist and they use it to cause <laughs> blunt force trauma. So this is a story of Fighting Bob Schuler. Did you know anything about Fighting Bob? Re- Reverend Bob Schuler? Uh, Reverend Fighting boxer. Bob Schuler. He's not a boxer. I know. He was a reverend who used his position of power and gift with words to cause verbal blunt force trauma to most public figures in Los Angeles. Yeah, so, that's how I know. Yeah. <laughs> so he was born Robert Pierce Schuler, August 4th, 1880 in Comer's Rock, Virginia. Uh, Which one's the state? Which one's the description of the state? The Rock was just the... It's how you knew you were there. Dwayne Johnson, Virginia? Comer's the Rock, Virginia. (laughs) From what I read, Comer's Rock sounds like everything you expect a place like Comer's Rock, Virginia to be like. It's It's a perfect place to leave? Yeah. It was just white, poor, and Protestant. (laughs) That's what their their city flag said. That was my nickname in high school. (laughs) That was my bio. (laughs) (laughs) That was my Twitter bio. (laughs) So his dad was a Methodist minister and his mom was named Rosa Elvira. That was what she was best known for. You're best known for having those two names. For your name. Some people know me by my my name. Um, <laughs> you might know me from my name. Here's a good name for you. His uncle's name was Pow Delp. Spell it. First name P-O-W. Like a prisoner of war. <laughs> Maybe that was his nickname. <laughs> his last name was D-E-L-P. Pow Delp. Pow Delp. It sounds like he, if you get hit was twice r- by Batman. I know, he was written sound. by Bob Kane. <laughs> This insulated religious upbringing made him grow up believing deeply in manifest destiny and that God created America for himself to be enjoyed by white Europeans. Yeah, it's all fun and games until we find out what Poe Delp believed in. <laughs> it's uh, all fun and games until they're looking up real estate in LA. And you're like, Jesus, I want to bring that stuff over here. By the way, Poe Delp is in episode nine. 
interesting. <laughs> this led him to attend the Emory and Henry College in Virginia, and then he got ordained at age 23 when he started preaching around Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas mm-hmm. until 1920 when he decided to move his wife and six kids yeah. to Los Angeles. No room. Uh, sorry, occupied. <laughs> what year was that? Sorry. 1920. So he saw Los Angeles as, he described it as the only city in the nation in which white American Christian idealism still predominates. Okay. Which leads me to believe he had no idea what Hollywood was at the time. He must have only stayed in Los Feliz like what <laughs> most people do when they come to LA. No culture and they just stay on like Franklin. Well, he loved going to the UCB. We knew that. <laughs> because he liked white Protestants. <laughs> so he came to LA and took the job as the reverend at the Trinity Methodist Church that used to be at 1201 South Flower Street, like a couple blocks away from Staples Center. And it's the parking lot of Hooters or something now. So the, the church had been around, as it was destined, yeah, let's do the sign of the cross. But when you go across, boy, do you have to go across. But the only sign of the cross that takes two hands. So the church had been around since 1870, but they were deeply in debt in 1920 and they were losing their congregation. So Schuler had developed a reputation as being one of those fire and brimstone type preachers. Yeah. So he would scream and shout and spit and everyone loved it. Yeah. So this was, it was a popular style before, of preaching. Before rock bands started. Yeah, this had. was all you had. He was, he was so cool. His, Leather jacket. His white collar was so tight. You could almost see his Adam's apple. <laughs> It was really popular. So the church wanted to boost their ticket sales and it worked because, you know, like the people will come to see this. So his congregation, they hired him. The congregation started to grow and grow and grow. But he wasn't just there to draw a crowd. He was here to protect the white Christian Eden that was Los Angeles at the time, according to him. So he called himself one of God's watchmen on the walls of the city. So he took it upon himself to, there used to be walls around Los Angeles also. (laughs) He took it upon himself to use his influence over his growing congregation to call out everything and everyone he thought was wrong in the city. This is what you know him for. This included, but was not limited to, jazz, Catholics, the Knights of Columbus, because they were Catholics, and they eventually sued him for libel, but he won. What he called the Jew-owned industry of Hollywood. Come on. Come on. That's their bio. <laughs> the Los Angeles Public Library, he hated. Wow, really? What, they, socialism? They offered book Socialism and they offered books with liberal ideas. I want this man's head on a stick. Go ahead. It would still draw a crowd if it was yeah. on that stick. Uh, the river sticks. So the YMCA, he hated because they had Saturday night dances that occasionally went past midnight into Sunday, which was the Sabbath. So you can't be dancing on the Sabbath. He also hated Amy Semple McPherson, who uh, he I, probably hated her most of all. I remember when I did her story, that, that was a name that kept coming up. And yeah. I'm like, who is this? Right. Who's this man? Who's, who's this rock and roller? <laughs> who's this fiery young <laughs> reverend? <laughs> who's the white little Richard? So he called Amy Semple McPherson a hypnotist and said that she was... <laughs> <laughs> He said that she was duping good people and was too wild and sensual and what she was So doing, was he! He wasn't sensual. So, no, okay, but neither was she. That's what I meant to say. She she, she wasn't... I don't know, because she was a woman. Anything a woman does was sensual to him. She had short hair. Okay, go ahead. Oh, stop, uh, please. Slow down, Greg. Yummy. He said that what she was doing was just as bad as bootlegging. I'm not going to argue with Which is good, because bootlegging is not that bad. So, in, <laughs> in, in, moving away from her, in 1927, Why? there was a show... She's making me too sensual. In 1927, there was a show going on at the Follies Theater called The Hot Mama Review. Oh, hell yeah. So, of course, he went to check it out, and then immediately he told the police chief what was going on, who then raided the theater and shut down the show. What uh, year was it? 1927. Hmm. I think I know the police chief. Go ahead. I might know the guy responsible yeah, for this. So, the, the 27 hot mamas that were in this show were brought to court for indecent exposure, but they were let off free, and uh, they made a movie about this called uh, 12 Horny Men. <laughs> It's 12 vignettes. Courtroom After Dark was the alternate title. Bob Schuler had a magazine that he humbly titled Bob Schuler's Magazine. And if you couldn't already guess the sort of stuff that is in this magazine, the only issue I could find online, the front page of it said... Uh, Jews. <laughs> he, he had what I guess you could call a poem titled, Is It Booze? And it went like this. Uh, Read it in Bob Schuler's voice. What is the issue? Is it booze? With 10 million Americans out of work, is it booze? <laughs> With 100,000 little homeowners in California losing their homes, is it booze? With one public official making a private fortune of $500 million in eight years while the middle class American is plunged into bankruptcy, is it booze? <laughs> With the cost of government mounting 300% in 10 years, is it booze? Indeed, what is this issue? Is it booze? <laughs> that was the front page, oh, just on white. That's so of funny. Of course, white. Yeah. <laughs> Why would it be any other color? White on white. Um, if you're white enough, you can read this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just ridiculous that's stuff. A, that's adorable. But there was also, I, I, I flipped, not flipped through, I digitally flipped through it. A scroll, I guess you would call it. There was an ad in the middle of that article to buy baby alligators. They were a dollar each or two fifty for three. I have a question. Yeah. Baby alligators. Is it booze? <laughs> <laughs> People are buying alligators and they're turning up crocodiles. Is it booze? Is, is it, it booze? Is it juice? <laughs> 
<laughs> but he wasn't just against booze, Jews, and hot mamas, which is... Your review. So Your... I'm bringing that to the Follies Theater. This December, just in time for Hanukkah, booze, Jews, and hot mamas. The Daniel's Afrin story. It's really mothers, though. It's they have mothers. a fever. So most importantly, aside from that sort of stuff, he was railing against social and political issues. You know, we can't... We can't offend this guy, but he was a leader in the local progressive movement, which sounds good, but But, was really a mixed bag. He was furious when a mob of KKK guys killed two black men, but at the same time, he openly supported the KKK. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that was like... We're supposed to send him to trial. I'm sure there's something like that. Let him get convicted first, and And then then we can lynch him. Yeah, there's ways to do this, but you're all proceeded to this. uh, We need the judge (laughs) to get paid. We need everyone else to get... We need the police to get paid. He did not like the police. (laughs) He he hated most city officials. He called them criminals who spoil paradise. In 1923, he heard rumors that LAPD chief Louis Oakes was a playboy and a drunk, so he followed him one night and saw him living up to that reputation and then preached against him so hard to his followers that Oakes was soon fired and denied pension. So it wasn't just allegations he was flinging at people. He was actually making a difference in the city. And like I said, some of that was actually good stuff, like getting rid of corrupt yeah. cops and things like that. He got rid of a lot of LAPD corruption, actually. He got a lot of the LAPD protected brothels and gambling dens shut down. He was very outspoken against the very corrupt Mayor George Cryer who mm-hmm. also sued him for libel. Schuler was head of the ministerial union in LA, so he would often lead groups of ministers and reporters directly to the offices of the mayor and other people in City Hall unannounced, and he would call them out for their corruption in front of everybody. Jeez. The biggest leap he made, though, was in 1927 when he raised $25,000 to start his own radio station, KGEF, which stood for Keeping God Ever First. You could have titled that better, but then again, you could have just called it... Uh, KKKF. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Schuler Magazine was a great title. Why stray from that? KB. K Bob. So now this meant he could not just reach whoever could fit into his church, but also whoever had a radio within however many miles of Los Angeles. Yeah. Alex Jones fans. Wait till you hear the similarities here. Okay. The station had religious conversations and hymns and all that sort of thing, but the big show was Bob's sermons. They were fiery and like he was known for, and they were riddled with accusations and lies and Hollywood gossip. So he would just pounce on any rumor he heard and call these people out and attack them to no end. He accused the city health department of forcing women to get medical examinations only from men. He accused <laughs> the president of USC of teaching evolution or <laughs> as he called it monkey business. <laughs> oh, that is the best title for I anti-evolution. I know. I was looking up like, is that really what it, where is like, which came first? Yeah. There's <laughs> actually a bunch of monkeys tried to open up a bank. It was original. Thing. It was all these monkeys. They were jumping on a bed and he was against them. <laughs> One of them fell down broke his head. I can support this. Is this the liberal America you want? They is this out. the American Catholics want? <laughs> and we evolved from that. As his kids are jumping on his head. In 1929, during the rape trial of Alexander Pantages, which yeah. we talked about a while ago, mm-hmm. he started saying on his show that Pantages was bribing the jurors, which helped influence the guilty verdict against him. But after the trial, the Bar Association went after Schuler, and he got sentenced to 30 days in jail for contempt of court. And he couldn't have been happier about that because now he was a martyr. Yeah. He loved it. Once you get kicked off of YouTube, you become a martyr. Wait till you hear. Are you going to lead to Alex Jones? Because I don't want to hear about it. Well, this man, he grew up to be. <laughs> this is the Pinocchio version of him, but when he comes a real boy, comes Alex Jones. I want to be a real Catholic. <laughs> when he got out of prison, he bragged that he got butter instead of margarine in there and that they made him a specially tailored prison suit complete with a tie. So it was a lot of hurtful gossip he was spewing. But again, he was also right about the local government being corrupt. I mean, yeah, yeah no. I know, yeah, okay, you're right. You're you, right. You're, you're aware of You can't of it. defend him. You can be awful and still write about something. Well, here's a perfect example. He helped get Mayor Cr- Cryer kicked out of office, but also helped get John Clinton Porter erected in 1929, a man who had been in the KKK. Yeah, he was a teetotaler. That's why he probably liked him. Yeah. Porter was also like, is this booze? And that's how they got, became friends. I wanted to ask you something. <laughs> is friends. this booze? Someone <laughs> else, someone who's going to come up later in the show, he helped get Two Gun Davis fired. He was so popular, he managed to grow his congregation to 6,000 people, making it the biggest in Southern California at the time. And he was also a great promoter of things. He had gimmicks, like one Mother's Day, he promised a gift to the mom who brought the most children to church and the winner who brought her seven sons was a Mrs. Hahn, mother of Kenneth Hahn. Really? Yeah, oh. so he was there. Oh. A descendant of Schuler. <laughs> but his real power was in this radio show. At his height he had 600,000 listeners which made him one of the country's first big radio ministers. They said that his word could influence the vote of 60,000 people in any given election, which he proved in the 1928 presidential election when he turned a large part of the city against Al Smith because he said he was a Catholic and he part of the Pope's plan to murder Protestants Protestants in their sleep, so they decided not to vote for him. I mean, it was true. Catholics. That's what we do. We all have a knife for it. We keep it in our, we relic, cro- we in our reliquary. No, bro. You think this is one of an apostle's bones. It's actually my knife that I'm going to murder a Protestant with. <laughs> Al Smith
Smith ended up losing that election to Herbert Hoover, who shortly after started the Great Depression. So they started it. I got an <laughs> throw idea. the switch. <laughs> I've got this crazy idea, guys. Tents as far as you can see. <laughs> Just whoo, everywhere. I'll vote for that. As long as I don't get killed in my sleep by the Pope. A businessman standing on the 53rd floor of a building. Think Tears of the views. In. <laughs> but it is, is this views? <laughs> <laughs> it is weird to think how a guy spewing this hateful, mostly wrong stuff on the radio can influence an election and change things for the worse. <laughs> So the LA t- Glad that's over. We were so naive we back were so, then. God, we're so foolish. So the LA Times feared him and he said that he held all records for attacks upon everybody, everything. The newspapers covered him endlessly. The amount of coverage he got in the papers was rivaled only by Amy McPherson and Clara Bow. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the new, the, Clara Bow. Ooh, hello. Oh, uh, hello. I'd like to see girl. those two in a headline. <laughs> Here's a headline. Yummy. The newspapers are the ones who gave him his nickname Fighting Bob. Yeah. So the attention, again, that the media gave him is what enabled him and gave him his power and the public loved him racing and all because he was a straight talker which sounds so familiar (laughs) so like it or not Schuler was a leader in fighting for a non-corrupt LA government and there was no stopping all the racism that came along with that because he already had the power but all good witch hunts must come to an end (laughs) and they usually end the same way by calling a wrong person a witch so eventually he accused his partner in not crime Reverend Gustav Brigleb love that white name he accused him of taking donations from the notorious Charles Crawford the wolf the gray wolf yep so something that Schuler said he, he would sooner baptize a skunk than take donations from him which he he did live on air. Are skunks not baptized? Are we not Catholic? <laughs> we are many things. We are trash eaters, but are we Catholic? Is the Pope skunk or whatever they're saying? <laughs> pretty soon after these accusations. What's, he, sorry, what's one more time, not yeah. to interrupt, but mm-hmm. what was the last guy's name? Gustav? Brigleb. But not long after this, he had made one too many powerful enemies and the tide started to turn against him. And in November 1931, he had his broadcasting license revoked by the Federal Radio Commission, who said he was not operating in the public's interest. So this was a very controversial move. And the ACLU even fought this decision in the Supreme Court, but he was not given his license back. But this and what Amy McPherson was doing sparked the government to keep a closer eye on the the ideas that were being disseminated over the radio. But this just prompted Fighting Bob into wanting something bigger than just running a church. I want to own the airwaves. I, I want to air. be a radio. <laughs> He wanted to become president of the United States. So in 1932, he ran for the U.S. Senate as a prohibitionist, and thank God he lost, but he still got 564,000 votes. Supposedly, he was so upset with L.A. when he lost that he put a curse on the city, who some say caused the Long Beach earthquake the next year. I can't prove him wrong. I can't say no, that wasn't the curse. Was it booze? (laughs) This derailed him pretty badly, and it wasn't until 1942 that he tried again, but on a smaller scale, running for the 12th Congressional District on a campaign that accused everyone in Washington of being drunk, but he lost yet again, and with that, what of it? The la- yeah, so what? So what? Burp. He lost the last of his popularity. In 1953, he retired and put his son, Bob Jr., in charge. Pacifist Bob, as they called him. So he put him in charge of the church, which eventually got torn down in 1982. Fighting Bob Schuler died September 11th, 1965. In Conspiracy! C- <laughs> in Carmel Valley. It- Was it an inside booze? <laughs> so he died in Carmel Valley. He's buried in Rose Hills Memorial Park in Whittier, but his legacy should best be remembered as always vote in every election. <laughs> Good lesson. Yeah. Fighting Pop Show. It's so weird. You know, in the House of the Seven Gables, which I just finished just after finished. six months of reading. How it. do you how do you feel about Nathaniel Hawthorne before you continue? Old. <laughs> One of the ideas of the book is like people can be so optimistic about the future and like things are going to change and get better, but what they don't realize is like everyone always thought that and nothing's ever changed, Nothing. nothing's ever gotten yeah. better, and like I keep reading I, all these stories of like, oh my god, we're just repeating the same storyline over I, and over. I really hate quoting this all the time because it's so hack now, but I keep thinking time is a flat circle. <laughs> time is absolutely a flat. <laughs> I hate repeating this because it's so hack now, but not the mama. Ah, That's also true, detective, right? Well, let's have our next story. Uh, Greg, the title of this is Flat Nose, Fast Feet. (laughs) They also said that about me when I was playing baseball. It's 1950 in Jewish Harlem, and at the age of 11 years old. Which Jewish Harlem? Boyle Heights? No, actually in New York. Jewish Harlem? That's what I said. I kept reading that over and over in different newspapers, Jewish Harlem. I assumed it was a different part of Harlem. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe they're referring to the Lower East Side as Jewish Harlem. I was going to ask you, but uh, you mocked me. So it's 1915. It's Jewish I know Harlem. It really is, but I'm not allowed to say <laughs> New York City. <laughs> it's all of New York. Jewish Harlem. Is this booze? <laughs> At the age of 11 years old. Is this booze? 
No, it's Manischewitz. <laughs> you can drink a lot of it. It won't do anything. At the age of 11 years old, young Max Rosenblum was sent away to the Hawthorne Reform Home for Jewish Boys after he punched a school teacher <laughs> oh and knocked God. out two of her teeth. Oh my God. And he was 11? 11 years old. Jeez. Upon his release two years later, he began boxing at the behest of a future Hollywood actor and so begins the tale of Slapsy Maxie. <laughs> <laughs> this is also Greg's Dr. Seuss book he's working on. Max was born in New York in 1904 and was raised on the tough streets of I put Jewish Harlem again. <laughs> in an effort to stray her son away from the brutality of the New York streets, Max's mother enrolled her son in ballet school. <laughs> But of course, that only... I don't want you to get in fights on the street. I'm sending you to <laughs> ballet school. No <laughs> one will fight with you. As we've already figured that out, it made the brutality of the streets even more potent. <laughs> he frequently had to go at it with bullies who wanted to give him a different moniker, ballerina. More of a title, really. <laughs> it's a job description. It's more of a job description. <laughs> Prima ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> at an early age, Max was proving to be a hothead. He was quick to fisticuffs with any Joey or Frankie that stepped up to him, which is how he ended up in reform school after giving his female teacher an invitation to the ground. But reform school had done little like for... Like Somebody. I want you to be a friend of mine. Reform school had done very little for Max. He quit school in the third grade saying he chose to, quote, quit school in the third grade because I didn't want to pass my father who was in the fourth. He was a New York street tough, wisecracking and hustling and brawling. Usually that path doesn't lead to success unless you want to mug people in Central Park. Mm. But this time, <laughs> it did lead to success because Max was saved by a local guy and neighborhood pal, future Hollywood man George Raft, who some might remember from his role in the original Scarface. He played Ronaldo. He was in okay. Some Like It Hot. He was Spats Columbo, the bad guy. Oh, okay. And now, he was now in, we're talking. Yeah. Yeah, he was in uh, They Drive By Night, which is a film noir classic. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you do George Raft? Did we do the same guy? What is the movie called? They Drive By Night. Then I'm talking about a different movie with a very similar title What's yours on. called? He Walked By Night. Okay, that's a different movie. One's a prequel. <laughs> it's only one Then he guy. got money and then he drove by night. He met some friends and they drove, so they <laughs> drove by night. Raft suggested to Rosenblum that he switch from ballerina to boxer. He loved this idea. And guess what? It took. I've read this phrase several it's, times. This is the original Cinderella, man. <laughs> this is uh, Rocky. I've read this phrase several times in different articles, so it must be true. Rosenblum was released into the custody of George Raft. Another article from 1934 says at the age of 30, so much older, says that Raft purchased half interest in Max's contract, paying $10,000 for Max. So Raft, who was, according to the same article, was the best informed man in Hollywood and boxing. I'm bearing the lead a little bit. But what I'm trying to say is George Raft's involvement in Max isn't a flash of interest. It's not just like a thing. Yeah, I medicate one. He's, he's like his he's, mentor. He's his mentor. And he like stick, he sticks by him through the years and stuff. Max was, was known in his coming up years for being a really eccentric fighter. He had a really eccentric defensive boxing style which utilized his ability to dance gracefully he was very loose on the mat this came from dancing and prancing to avoid blows he also returned blows but not with a fist but with open hands in 1923 Damone like Bruce like, Lee yeah like Bruce Lee like with a with a palm it's, uh, that's what I've read so I, I didn't see footage of it or anything but it said open hands <laughs> with or, open arms he would come fight come here in 1923 Damone Runyon a sports writer dubbed Rosenblum as Slapsy Maxi because he would do this oh okay yeah. that makes sense I imagine from the appearance of slapping opponents yeah his biggest boxing Is that allowed uh, like, not anymore or I'm sure, pretty sure. Yeah. He was the first MMA fighter. Yeah, yeah, they don't want to say that. The liberal media doesn't want to say that. The Protestant media Protestant doesn't media want you to know. Protestant media doesn't want you to know that he's Catholic where. media. <laughs> His biggest boxing achievement comes in June of 1930 at the age of 25. Slapsy Maxi won the American version of a lightweight title from Jamie Slattery after 15 rounds. And in 1932, he Pretty won the... Slappery he turned him into. In 1932, <laughs> he won the world title with another 15-round decision. He is still regarded by some outliers as one of the best lightweight boxers in history. Hmm. But besides training for boxing, which he didn't do much, much of apparently he also gambled and hoard around more than Manny Pacquiao <laughs> <laughs> Maxi was very adamant though that he never touched a drink he wanted everyone mm -hmm. to know that but many recall what is it booze we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about this brown drink. <laughs> Many recall that Maxi was the last to leave dance halls and cafes, even the day of a fight. So like he partied a lot. He might not have drank, but he partied a lot. <laughs> I'm not quite too sure how he landed some of his early roles in Hollywood films, maybe through Raft, but he got some bit parts here and there. And he was no stranger to Los Angeles. His bouts would bring him through stadiums and arenas. He fought at Gilmore Park Arena. Uh, one of his last fights was at the Wilmington Bowl, which is one of the Harbor Area's central stadiums for events. Around 1933, it's said that the Hollywood crowd fell in love with Slapsy Max. Maxie, who had a com he had comedic chops. He would draw huge laughs for parodying the moves of a punch drunk fighter. One of his funniest lines he threw around was, I quit fighting because Joe Lewis was afraid to fight me. Yeah, he was afraid he would have killed me. <laughs> he had his first role in a feature film in 1933 while he was still boxing as a boxer, if I remember correctly. So he he kind of is uh, Dwayne Comer's Rock Johnson. Kind of, or, yeah. Or uh, what's his name? John Cena? Yeah, he's one or, of those. Or uh, Dave Bautista? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, he, he lands a role as a big tough guy and then yeah. suddenly gets roles. Suddenly he's an alien and he's supporting a, a pedophile. To <laughs> <laughs> Don't start. He lost his title in 1934 and continued fighting for another five years. In 1939, he hung up his gloves after a pretty good career. 200 wins with 18 knockouts over 289 matches. Great How boxing record. How do 
you slap with gloves? I don't know if they had gloves at the time. They probably did, but, but he, he hung probably... up his gloves. Did he cut his hands off? Yeah, he cut his hands. <laughs> they were different kinds of gloves. Time to hang him up. That's how he used to be before gloves were invented. They were, but it, it makes you really good with a lightsaber. He had a great boxing record. <laughs> and with that great boxing record, he also had a flattened nose and cauliflower ears. Ugh. And old age was peeking over the hill at him. And it was time to look for... Not a for, good look. Not a good look for... Unless you're playing a boxer in all your movies. Yeah. It was time to look for another career path. With the help, of course, of another Hollywood figure. And what a figure. Uh, he, <laughs> he'd been pokering his flattened nose around Hollywood for some time. He had a couple roles in small movies. <laughs> like his, But in 1937, two years after his boxing retirement, he had been asked by actress Carol Lombard to show her how to box, claiming that she wanted her puncher future husband, Clark Gable... <laughs> when she felt like he deserved it. I could think of a point where he deserved it, when he sexually assaulted Loretta Young. Who remembers things like that? Come on. Who remembers that Kirk Douglas apparently attacked Natalie Wood? Who remembers stuff like that? Really? I read it. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but I mean, what, it read it. How many people attacked her? I mean, one guy killed her. Yeah, well, I, thought, I think two guys killed her and one tried. <laughs> in exchange for the boxing lessons, Lombard put Slapsy Maxi in her film, Nothing Sacred. And according to the things I've read, he's excellent in the movie. And the tough guy roles just kept coming. He played Big Julie in Guys and Dolls later in his career. Really? He, yeah, he was He was also in a movie called The Louisiana Purchase. He, <laughs> he was played in, Louisiana. Yeah, he was a big guy. Eben Costello meet the Keystone Cops, which is my favorite multiverse. And he was in the Beat Generation with uh, <laughs> Vampire and Nermy. Bit parts, nothing like, okay. he wasn't like a star of it, but you'd see him around saying yeah. something like, I'm a boxer. You want to hear my line about uh, Joe Lewis? He quickly found his Joe gimmick. Joe Frazier, which everyone... It was Joe Lewis. You were thinking about Joe Frazier because we've been watching... Yeah, uh, we're watching Muhammad Ali interviews. He what? won't shut up about how much better he is than Joe Frazier. I'm sure it was a big deal to him. He's pretty good, but he's no Joe Frazier. That boxer over there? Is he's he boos? The <laughs> <laughs> he quickly found his gimmick in character actor roles, playing boxers or comic thugs. Punch drunk, who would say, these and damn and those, as in, those aren't the boys the boss is looking for. It's them guys, those ones. He really laid into a New York accent. Apparently, after... After he got that role in Nothing Sacred, Jack Warner had him sign a contract for his studio. Slapsy Maxi saw this as his big break, and he started taking acting and diction lessons from <laughs> Max Reinhardt, which is where he met Marlon Brando. Oh, no. Max would tell friends that Brando sounded just like him. <laughs> so Max returns to Jack Warner after learning how to pronounce words and talk like a person, and three <sighs> weeks later, Warner fired Max because that wasn't the real Maxi. Huh. I liked you when you were raw, but that's show business, I liked you baby. you were illiterate. <laughs> show business, and Max is now in Angelino, living in historic Hollywood Plaza Hotel in Vine and Hollywood. I thought you meant right now. He's right now. He got me towed. I parked in front of his own. <laughs> he pulled the car himself. <laughs> around, I'll take care of this. <laughs> uh, around 1937, it appears he tried to open up a nightclub, Cabaret deal. So after World War One, there was a steady migration of the city's Jewish community moving up the west side of town. Bob Schuler must have hated it. Yeah. yeah. Bob Schuler was like, where are they going? Hey, 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 hey everyone slow down. <laughs> Stop taking all that money. Taking all that money that's in Boyle Heights. <laughs> yeah, so they start moving to the Fairfax area. And at the time, there was two big Jewish-oriented comedy cabarets. There was Billy Gray's Bandbox, and there was Slapsy Maxie's at 7165. He was Jew? Yeah, he's from Jewish Harlem. Okay. Yeah. And his dad was like a rabbi or something. No father figure at yeah, present, which I didn't think about till right now. Did I'm he like, have a rabbi? I figure. George Raff wasn't Jewish. No, I don't know. Prob I don't know. I'm not, I'm not here to cast aspersions. <laughs> I think he was Catholic. I don't know. Is it booze? That cross on his necklace? Is that booze? Or that just mean he went to Hooters? <laughs> Slapsy Maxie's nightclub was at 7165 Beverly Boulevard. Maxie owned this place, and which opened in November. Where is that? That's in... You'll find out. Oh, no. In November of 1937. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Our worried robot that sits next to us and no one never sings the sound. <laughs> oh, no. I calculate. Oh, no. There are a lot of varying stories about this particular spot, but I can't find a lot of stuff confirmed because well, you'll find out but it was noted as being a celebrity hotspot in 1943 performance permits were denied by the police commission officers testified that show skits went beyond the limits of decency whatever probably butts or something so slapsy maxis <laughs> closes after six years of operating and a space letter became the new beverly cinema whoa yeah wow all is well because slapsy maxi moves from beverly and la brea to the miracle mile at the old art deco wilshire bowl location on wilshire and cochran about half a mile away or a mile and a half away sorry now this is the place that's truly renowned so a lot of stories i read, read about slapsy maxis i didn't know which one it was but if i traced it by years it was most likely happened in this place he'd get performances from jackie gleason and spike jones the comedy guy not nah, director i'm pretty sure this is the aren't they both kind of both they ride the line of being the same <laughs> guy the same, same <laughs> exact same guy. yeah old spike jones did music videos with the beastie boys he also loved skateboarding <laughs> girl skateboards mouse is fantastic comedy skateboarding fan, fan, uh, um, uh, 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 ollie um, uh, <laughs> my heart's doing an ollie <laughs> thinking about this slap season maxis was the la debut of a comedy duo dean martin and jerry lewis uh, really they, yeah. yeah martin and lewis even cast maxi in their role in uh, hollywood or bus which is a super great movie i saw a screening of it at the new beverly uh <laughs> now not only did slap maxi act and not only 
only did he open up nightclubs and not only did he act and, box <laughs> and open and, up nightclubs no, and box and, uh, and act but apparently was a stand-up comedian quotations oh, no. although i'm sure in those days it meant a uh, funny person on an elevated platform <laughs> under lights like it like it's so vague uh, what i they think meant. funny is a strong statement <laughs> he was at a he, what do boxers the, think they're funny go on <laughs> <laughs> you think Muhammad Ali is pretty funny? He is. You've been, you've he been is watching, quite funny, actually. I, I keep saying you're watching Jack Parr. You're not watching Jack Parr. You're watching <laughs> the other guy. Uh, Dick Cavett. Dick Cavett. Yeah, the watching. other forgotten talk show host. <laughs> Maxi was a stage comedy performer person. He had uh, writers for sketches and gags, but he was very good, apparently, at ab-libbing, too. He, ab-libbing? Ad-libbing. Well, for boxers, it is ab-libbing. ab-libbing. He was some interviewer's favorite person to talk to. He was very funny and clever on the spot. He, like, really gave into that character of being, like, a dumb boxer, probably because... Mm. Quite a character. He, he uh, really <laughs> wow. lost himself in that role. Try not to stray away too much from the character you've made. They would bait him with questions that almost demand funny answers. One article had examples like, which sweet thing would you want to marry? Or how much did you lose at the track? Like questions that would just like, Which sweet thing would you want to marry? I mean, Claire Beau, the it girl. Which of these pieces of meat that walk and talk <laughs> would you like to marry? Maxie was sort of always that character, as we've said. But people love that genuineness of it. He was a New York guy. He was a fish out of water, gambling and mingling. Like a filter fish out of water. Uh, I don't get that. Uh, gambling and mingling. By the way, that's going to be the name of my biography. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. you're pointing to like a priest like white collar thing and you're like doing the confused like what i'm just a little gefilte fish in a big pond <laughs> he was just like a new york guy here gambling and mingling with movie stars and gangsters and looking the part of an old boxer because he was an old boxer he I must hit. have loved mickey cohen uh-oh <laughs> robot be quiet <laughs> stop that he had a comedy performance routine for a while with another actor boxer max bear and the two of them apparently would perform at the florentine gardens on why Hollywood do i know Boulevard. the name max bear well i'll tell you every time my dad brings up max bear he mentions his famous son max bear was a famous boxer of his time you might have heard of max bear before max bear's son was jethro in the beverly hillbillies max bear jr oh my god that's weird every time my dad goes into an old boxing story and he'll like lean in like that's jethro's dad <laughs> That's Jethro's paw. <laughs> now the paw that you see in the TV screen is not his real paw. It's an actor. <laughs> Don't forget that, son. <laughs> if I teach you one thing in this life, is one thing, it is booze. <laughs> if you're thing, ever wondering. <laughs> it is booze. So in 1940, Slapsy Maxie was arrested on Hollywood <laughs> near his home, Hollywood and Vine. Under the police officer's report, it said, under observation on suspicion of bookmaking. Ooh. Who else do you know that's a boxer and an actor and a gangster in Hollywood who likes bookmaking? Anyways, Slapsy Maxie claimed that he just picked the lottery ticket off the pavement and the office as the officer approached. This is a coincidence. Also on the report, when it him it lists his occupation as dancer which is funny never for, <laughs> never forget your roots boxer yes actor comedian yes ballerina ballerina yes but booking no 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 <laughs> your honor his connection to crime people was suspected by most accounts slapsy maxi's nightclub was a bookmaking joint for gambling baby and you know was a host for cops and judges on payroll many people say that max was simply a front man for a boyle heights guy mickey cohen i mean it's inevitable like he ran the city well, he if, ran all if, the bookie things if you're a jewish guy involves in a career that is heavily tied to the gangsters and mafia and there's a huge Jewish gangster in town like why why, wouldn't, also, why wouldn't you go to him and both of you are boxers you're yeah. probably going to get along anyways yeah. Cohen was making like $160,000 a month from this operation <laughs> and feeding it into Max's nightclub funny enough I also read that Mickey Cohen ran another entertainment spot was the band box which was the other Jewish oriented cabaret <laughs> near Fairfax 1940s LAPD I won't get into this as much because I'll be covering 20 to 30 but anyways 1940s LAPD also not great is there anything you couldn't pay him to do uh, or not to do I love double negative. Uh, anyways, you could could it pay to not or do uh, <laughs> make it any clearer? <laughs> anyways, the nightclub closes in 1950. It was replicated in Gangster Squad, which I I don't know if I've mentioned on this podcast guys how much I hated. I'm sure you have. Maxi continued getting small roles throughout the era of TV and movies. He had a small part in Rod Serling's Requiem for a Heavyweight from Playhouse 90. Sometime in the 1940s, he started a softball league at Gilmore Field. The team was called the Rosenblut Ragamuffs. And at first base was Jerry Lewis. Uh, oh my God. I read that an offshoot of this league continues to play Sunday mornings at West Hollywood Park. But after the nightclub closed and roles dried up, it, was, you know, it wasn't very pretty for him. He got a bit role on TV playing an assistant named Clyde on the Joe Palooka show in 1961. Uh, this is where I get sad. Max set up a fake mugging to get his name in the papers again. He oh reported that a man tried to kill him by firing a shotgun through his door, then disappeared. And apparently in 1968, while leaving his place, he was actually mugged and <laughs> hit pretty hard on the head with a pipe, which is straight 
straight out of a cartoon. And he woke up and he thought he was yeah, Joe Frazier. He spoke French. And stuff. <laughs> Unlike a cartoon, it took a very long time to recover. And it was kind of all downhill from there. He uh, had a caretaker for a while, but when that cleared up, he became a resident of the Braywood Sanitarium in South Pasadena after, you know, hey. you could only take so many blows to the head. Yeah, and it was the final blow. It was the final blow. <laughs> it sounds like a hospice, also sounds like a sanitarium where sometimes friends and family would visit, but then not all the time. In 1972, the Boxing Hall of Fame, I put Boxing Hall of Hame, inducted Slapsy. The Boxing Hall of Hame. In 1972, he was inducted into that. And in 1976, actor comedian boxer ballerina and nightclub <laughs> owner died at the age of 71 years old 289 fights 98 films and through all of it would not surrender to being a californian always a new yorker yeah. never learned how to drive had all his <laughs> friends and chauffeurs driving between racetracks and that's what it's like to refuse to sell it to la that is exactly what it's like. never once ate an orange <laughs> will not drink coca-cola will didn't not go out, to the beach didn't work out well for his friend marlon brando <laughs> How many boxer stories end happily? Honestly, I can't think of any. No, I can't. I mean, Muhammad Ali. The Muhammad no. Yeah, the, the Hummama. The Hummama. Most of you're going to get is going to be Muhammad Ali, who died of Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a pretty life for boxers. That's why you're yeah. supposed to get out when you're young. Any any athlete, you're not supposed to be doing that no, past you can't. like 40. Okay, so now let's move on to the next. This is a shorter one that's kind of, it's kind of weird. We've kind of addressed him a little bit here and there, but let's just get right into it. Hit me with it. Some nicknames come from some talent or crime or personality trait, but sometimes they just come because you're from a different country and hey that's weird <laughs> let's give you a nickname for that hey what are you doing here what's your name where are you from where are you from what's your name because that's your name <laughs> this is someone we've mentioned is playing a part in a lot of other different stories but now it's time to give the devil his due and talk about greek george caralambo hey. so his story is mostly lost to time Thanks. all right what's your next one <laughs> not much story here greg this is another thing. A lot of the details seem to be conflicting because apparently there were a lot of Greek Georges out there, but there are some definite things we know about him. I am Greek George. <laughs> I am, I am Greek, Greek George. George. Sorry to interrupt. Not really, but... Sorry, not sorry. I am Greek George. We know some things, and he was a part of a lot of weird incidents in LA history. So he was born around 1829 in Smyrna, which was Asia Minor, which is now... This is such an old story. It's now a part of Turkey. He was born okay. Yorgos... Caralumbo. We don't know anything about his early life, but we do know he somehow got involved with camels. And come and come the late 1850s, the United States decided to start something called the United States Camel Corps. The, my least favorite punk scene. I, I go Camel Corps. That's all I do. <laughs> it's all about sex. Humps. Get it? No. Not a lot of drinking. It is not booze. Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> I like the silence, but nobody's going to be able to tell that I was staring at you intently with my hands up and you had to be like, it's not booze. So this, the Camel Corps, it was a plan by future president of the Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis, who was then leader of the War Department to bring the ship of the desert, aka camels, to an environment where their particular skill set could be useful, the deserts of the American Southwest. So his plan was like, well, we have a desert here. Why don't we get camels? They go to the desert. We have a desert. Camels in the desert. Okay. That was the plan. So I feel like they're missing a missing ingredient, which is a desert. There's a desert. I, we've driven to Arizona. We do, there, right. That's a desert. It's a different kind of desert than the camel yeah, desert. Yeah, it's not the Sahara Desert. Yeah, but, there's no like wind storm. Well, you'll hear why it didn't work out. Okay. So. Sorry. I, I feel like, yeah, you're right. I'm, yeah, come on. I, you're I, being a real Catholic right now. I'm just adding logic to yep, history. Like a Catholic. <laughs> but they weren't just any camels that they wanted. They wanted dromedaries, which are Arabian camels. That's what Obama used to kill little kids in Iran. A drum a, drum sh a camel drum strike. <laughs> so compared to a regular camel's 30 miles a day of travel, which we all know they're capable of, yeah. a dromedary could go 75 miles and a regular camel could carry up to 800 pounds and smoke 400 cigarettes, <laughs> while a dromedary could carry 1,000 pounds and smoke all the world's cigarettes. <laughs> they could go 10 days without water, which would make them way more useful than a horse or a donkey. The thirsty animals, they're, always, they're just begging for it. They're so thirsty. <laughs> so the plan was to use the camels to carry supplies and mail throughout the great American desert of Southern California to Arizona. They would create a road between Fort Tejon, a little north of Castaic, to Fort Defiance in Arizona and service the areas further south as well. So the U.S. spent $30,000 and got 34 camels shipped in early 1856. How much money did they spend? $30,000 to get 34 camels. Okay. I don't want to do the math, but that's, uh, you lost some money there, huh? No, 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 you no. You came out on the bottom of that <laughs> There's one. There's no huh? more sound investment than a camel. A camel in the American Southwest. <laughs> the desert of the future. <laughs> so they came in early 1856 
56 from Asia Minor to Texas, <laughs> which is the Asia Minor of America. And wasn't that, it wasn't Mexico? 1856. No, that was, that was, Texas oh, yeah, was Texas. You're right. Texas right. was Texas before California was California. Yeah, it had to be. I mean, further west. We're further west. I don't know. I forgot the Alamo. I don't know. They got them to Texas and then they rode them over to California. The guy in charge was Lieutenant Edward Fitzgerald Beale, which I feel like is a name we've seen before. The exact dates and where the camels exactly arrived and went is different in literally every source I read. <laughs> but at a certain point, there were 30 camels regularly going back and forth between Camp Latham and Culver City and the drum barracks in Wilmington. So there are a bunch of camels the, running just hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. What are those things, said the people who had ostrich farms and alligator farms? <laughs> what the hell is that? What the well, hell is that? What are these weird animals from the Orient coming? <laughs> so we also know that along with the second shipment of camels that arrived in Texas came our friend Greek George Carolombo. They cut open a hump and he was in there. <laughs> Hello. Him and a handful of other camel herders, including a guy named Haji Ali, who everyone called High Jolly. They got paid $15 a month to take care of the camels and use them to make connecting roads to places like Fort Yuma and also the Butterfield Overland Mail Route. He did this for seven years until the Civil War was a Bruin and the U.S. abandoned the camel program. So from what I read, either they were auctioned off or they just let them loose in Arizona and supposedly a few into the Hollywood Hills. That <laughs> explains go. a lot of stuff. That explains who's been drinking all my water once every month. I keep humping up there. That's why. I get it now. It's I'm, I must be that camel. But from here, the story of Greek George gets ridiculous. And some say it's conflated with the other Greek Georges in the area. Okay. It's kind of, what What am I thinking of? A legend? The legend of Greek George? What is it like? The Ballad of Greek George? The Ballad of Greek George is what I'm thinking of. Is it? No. Because uh, <laughs> that's a beautiful song. A lot of people taking over one moniker with the idea of... The mantle of... The, 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 <laughs> Keep talking. So I stop talking, please. Thank God. In 1865, he moved to New Mexico, where he shot and killed the son of the governor, and uh -huh. then and then faked his own suicide and headed west to get away from it, where he got a Mojave arrow shot into his thick beard on the way. Uh -huh. So this is part of his maybe true story. Okay. So there's no way that we could look into this because I feel like that should be the whole segment. <laughs> it happened in Arizona, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. He was heading west to join the hunt for gold in the Holcomb Valley, which was known at the time as the hellhole of the San Bernardino mountains and he ended up owning a saloon there where he got a reputation for shooting guys. He shot a cook. He shot a guy who cheered on a horse that beat his horse in a race. And he also shot a guy for filing down the tips of the horns of a bull that was about to fight a grizzly bear. Wow. Yeah. This is all made up. This is the irrefutable truth, this part of it. My favorite thing is that they were able to specify a part of San Bernardino as being a hellhole when we all know all of it is. Go ahead. The hellhole of hell. <laughs> it's pandemonium. It's the heart of hell. That's funny that because you read a lot. That's the joke there. I'm a good Catholic. <laughs> so whether this was our Greek George or some other Greek George or a combination of several Greek Georges, we pro we won't, we're never going to know. But yeah. where the story becomes solid is when our Greek George, Carol Lombo, moves to Los Angeles and becomes a U.S. citizen in 1867 and changes his name to George Allen. <laughs> Uh -huh. That's when he positions the government to give him a land grant for his camel service to the country. We thank you for your camel service. But all they ended up giving him was a useless area called Bolton Canyon, which is, as we already discussed a couple in a couple previous episodes, is the yeah. land that became the Hollywood Bowl. So he built a wood cabin there just to lay claim on the land, but he lived in an adobe on what is now Santa Monica Boulevard and ran the La Brea Way station at what is now Kings Road and Fountain near the Comedy Store, which was there at the time. Uh -huh. You dummy. It wasn't there. Pay attention. <laughs> that was a test. And I'm sorry to say, boy, oh boy. You passed. I was thinking about a fountain and I was like Paul Thomas Anderson talking to Mark Marin about the comedy store being haunted and how that whole area was always bad and I was thinking about that when you said comedy store that's all that's what I was thinking about and I was like yeah okay so he lived there with a Mexican woman he married named Maria Cornelia Lopez mm. when Maria became pregnant with what would become their son Greek American George <laughs> they moved onto the land in Bolton Canyon but a Slavic immigrant known only as Marsevich was squatting there and this is a story I've already told before but it's even better now that we have more context of who Greek George was so George wanted Mar Marsevich gone, but instead of his usual method of getting that sort of thing done, which was killing somebody, <laughs> he sued him and he won the case, but Marsevich refused to leave, so George bit his ear off. Jesus. Then he moved. <laughs> you forgot something. <laughs> <laughs> when did you bring that up? I'm, I'm struggling That was to in the, uh, I think the Tiburcio Vasquez. It might have oh, been, okay. it was either the Tiburcio Vasquez, who's coming up, or the uh, Hollywood Bowl episode. Okay. That was the opening ceremony of the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> this is the house, uh, here we go, where George ratted out his wife's sister and her her boyfriend when they came to visit to Bercio Vasquez. So those are the main events we know of Greek George's life. The rest are just scattered crazy things that don't quite make sense. Like in 1882, he became consul
constable of the La Bayona Township, and in 1885, he moved into Runyon Canyon. By 1900, Maria had died, and he remarried another Mexican woman named Concepcion Vejar. So when Charles Lummis met him in 1903, he said he no longer remembered any of his Greek, and he had never learned English, so he only spoke Spanish. So this was a And then he shot George Lummis. No, go ahead. <laughs> he bit off his nose. George Lummis. Charles Lummis. They married. They got married. <laughs> Greek George Lummis. He was a Greek immigrant living in early 1900s Los Angeles who only spoke Spanish. That's yeah, he, he died in Whittier on September 2nd, 1913, and he's buried at Founders Memorial Park. I feel like that's a perfect symbol for LA. I know. This yeah. guy who can only partake in a culture that's not his own. <laughs> Coming from a land that no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs> from an empire that was conquered 30 years ago. <laughs> so that's Greek George. Now we, we have his story. I want to hear your next story now. I cannot emphasize how excited I am to talk about the next story, which is titled Double Turkish Cor George. What? Double a corruption, double a gun. The tale of <laughs> Police Chief Jim Two Gun Davis. <laughs> James Edgar Davis was hard boiled. He was born in Texas in 1889 and came to California in 1911, a former cotton picker who Coming was. From, oh, it's one of those cotton picking Texans. You know, well, cotton picking Texans who was distinguishably poor and uneducated. Mm. It was so. He was it's so poor, Texas. it was a new class of poor. <laughs> You're so poor. <laughs> <laughs> How poor was he? Uh, is it booze? He ran away from home at 16, leaving an inhospitable living situation with the stepdad. He served some time in the army, fighting two years in the Philippines as part of two-year uh, Davis they called two him year Davis. <laughs> two years fighting in the Philippines as part of the field artillery he was also worked as something called a cow puncher no idea he was a <laughs> sometimes they get feisty a uh, cow doesn't want to give milk they open the door and he's just already walking up pulling up his sleeves <laughs> let me at him and it just milks itself <laughs> he was a delivery man for Wells Fargo he was a soda bottler which I cannot imagine him hmm. being he was a like street Laverne and Shirley like Laverne and Shirley a streetcar conductor and a locomotive fireman in 1912 he joins the LAPD the same year that the police department gets his first automobile ambulance, meaning that now people could die on the way to the hospital. <laughs> you don't have to die at home anymore. <laughs> I can't decide if I want to die at home or at the hospital. New place to die. <laughs> Double the pleasure. <laughs> 1925. The police pistol range at the police academy in Leisure Park opens up. That resulted in LA police officers becoming some of the most world famous pistol shots. That's the one that's by Dodger Stadium. Oh, the one that you can hear sometimes? Yeah. Okay. When my dad was a kid, after you'd hear pa, 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 him and his friends would go down to collect the bullets and then trade it in for money. The metal. To who? Well, you know, I never asked that part. <laughs> to the Jacksmith. The Jacksmith. The blacksmith. The blacksmith. I've been playing a game middle. called Jacksmith. <laughs> it's, you're a donkey and you make weapons. It's a... What? <laughs> <laughs> Records show that the markmanship training was one of the most effective ways of keeping organized crime out of Los Angeles during the waning years of prohibition. I feel like it was a pretty good way to keep law away. Then I wrote, how can that be seeing as most of the guys who are in support of rum running were also the ones at the pistol range? <laughs> Among the most talented of these crack shot gunmen were James Davis. There's even video that exists online of him shooting a cigarette out of a guy's mouth. Wow. This apparently was a party trick he do often. But practice wasn't meant for showing off for Davis. He believed markmanship would make him a better officer. He was such a pistol whiz that he got a nickname, Two Gun Davis. It came from these years of the pistol range and he was so good. So he would always carry, would he always carry two guns? I or? don't know. I think that I, if I remember the video, he did one, then the okay. next. Because I've seen it, the, the only picture I've seen of him, he's holding two, two guns. guns up, which is kind of, I mean, you know, guns aren't cool, but like, uh, I'm lying, they're cool. Guns <laughs> people don't cool are people. <laughs> People aren't cool. Guns are cool. It's guns don't make people cool. Bullets make people <laughs> cool. Taking a photo with guns makes guns cool. <laughs> one article from the LA Times, which seems to be one of many puff pieces from the LA Times about Davis, it is mentioned that he is credited with the development of the police recreation and training center, the one in Elysian Park at the Academy. It's saying that he is credited with that development along with developing their intensive training program. He gets a lot of credit. He was a very intense police officer. I read that he took part in 12,000 arrests in his early oh years God. as a beat cop. A compliment he achieved by working every beat in the central division. He was also on the detective squad. He worked as a fingerprint expert. He was a competent, hardworking police officer. That doesn't make you a good person. Let's put that in early on. You could be competent, still awful. Hardworking, still awful. In fact, you can be even worse if you're competent at it. And, and, and you work hard at being awful. Yeah. That's weird that a police force would be known for something, you know? Like, yeah. LAPD, watch out for their pistols. Pist yeah, yeah, with their great shots, the watch out for that. Boston PD, don't get near their bull whips. Don't, don't be Irish. They <laughs> Do not like that. That's all they like in Boston. <laughs> Those Catholics. <laughs> Maybe the most offensive episode. Yeah, because it's about you this time. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm oh, about, baby. I'm, oh, I said it. I'm going to go surfing. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I hated this episode, it's booze.
<laughs> Jim Tuga and Davis rose to the ranks at an incredible pace. That's also going to be the reviews of this episode. Is it booze? That's B-O-O-S. <laughs> that sound. Tuga Davis rose through the ranks at an incredible pace. And by 19... Okay, let's remember that he sets up the pistol range in 1925. In 1926, at the age of 37, he was made chief of police. The youngest man at that point to ever be appointed how, how to that position. How old is he? 30? 37. It's pretty young. It's pretty young. That's four years away from being me. And I'm not the chief of anything <laughs> except for offensive podcast episodes. Which, by the way, not really. In the grand scheme of things in the grand scheme of things you'll get over it the newspaper as i burp into the mic and then you did the tim the tool man taylor oh, 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 oh. we talked about boxing too much and now i'm joe rogan <laughs> the newspaper described davis as a crack shot a student of human nature an athlete and a oh, charming crack pot and a charming conversationalist by the way if you say a student of human nature that can mean how much pain can a person take and yeah. you're still a student of human nature one of my favorite quotes of his constitutional rights were no benefit to anybody except crooks and criminals okay he was also an expert woodsman and a noted mountain man a brute davis was in charge of a 50-man gun squad whose purpose was to hold coal on gunmen in los angeles street and want them brought in dead not alive and will reprimand any officer who shows the least mercy to any criminal which is pretty much what darth vader says when he <laughs> First and I want them alive, uh, but dead. But also dead. He's a man's man, meaning effortlessly cruel and vile. He was called sadistic and dictatorial. He's been described as being very vain, quite something of a dandy. Bob Schuler mm-hmm. said that he looked like he got a massage every morning and fingerna- <laughs> and he had his fingernails manicured. How could this man be chief of police? How could this man who showers be chief, <laughs> chief of police? Is it booze? Subjectively, quality descriptions or not, becoming police chief so fast was no easy task. Of course... He had help. Two men on opposing sides of a shadow war both agreed that Davis was their man. Harry Chandler of the LA Times and Ken Kane Parrott, who I pronounced his name last time wrong. I apologize. I said Parrott. <laughs> Ken Kane Parrott, the shadow mayor of Los Angeles. Both these guys liked Jim Davis. If you remember from Candy Daniel Liquors Quicker, click please here. click here. Sorry. The police department was being run by Ken Kane Parrott through Mayor Cryer. He got him elected. That made room for the combination, which was a criminal outfit running out of City Hall. They needed a man of brute force who was corruptible and that was Davis and he was in on the whole scheme. Chandler wanted Davis because he needed a man who hated communists and labor union folks as much as he did and boy are the two sides not compatible? No. They want different things because Chandler is anti-vice and Parat okay. is all it's, vice it's, okay. but Parat I forget how Parat benefits from the LA Times but he does. So they're on opposite sides of the war but they need to get along on certain things. Mm-hmm. I forget. I read it in LA Noir is a great book. You know what's also a great book for for crime and I never thought of it history of police department goes through over yeah, this well, so well they were there man they lived it they were the criminals that's why it's you get all the information about all, crime you get the sides of the cops and the criminals because they were the same this. person <laughs> Chandler wanted control of the red squad which took apart labor organizers and radicals Chandler did his part in never reporting or calling out the cops or calling the cops heroes for this so that's how he benefited that's why from we needed Bob Schuler. okay so Davis is chief of police city hall's corrupt everything's corrupt Chandler's running the LA Times and it's pretty much always taking the side against it seems like the working man whatever okay so before we go any further we have to talk about 1928 the wineville chicken coop murders do you know about that it sounds familiar have you seen the changeling no let's go over this it's truly horrific story i'm not going to get into it as someone who loves true crime i have my limits and my limits is child murder yeah. so the moore's murders dean coral and gordon northcutt with his chicken coop murders not my thing horrible story but they're involved with the lapd it's mira loma so it's out of county so we mm. can't talk about yeah. it gag out order of our jurisdiction. But in 1928, Walter Collins went missing. A little boy from Lincoln Heights, his mother, who had given him money to go to the movies, now he's vanished. Several boys go missing. Spoiler alert, their bones are buried in Mira Loma. There was a huge public push to find Collins, and Davis had the entire force looking for him because at the time, it was a really bad press-wise time for the LAPD. Scandals were starting to come to light, and they just needed to cover them. And if they found this kid that everyone looked for, this would cover it. So they mm-hmm. really were pushing to find this kid. You know, they just need that win, and Davis has his right-hand man, police captain J.J. Joe, or as I call him, JJJ. He was known for using dynamite. <laughs> that was his weapon of choice. I got really excited because I thought this was the same Captain Jones that was having the affair with Brenda Allen, but I think it was a different uh, Jones. Dr. Jones. Doctor, no time for love. Uh, some time for less, no time for love. JJJ is responsible <laughs> for finding Collins. And then the LAPD gets a call saying that they found Collins in another state. So they send the kid home. There's a big celebration and he gets off the trains and Mrs. Collins' mom says, that's not my son. And the LAPD says... 
we really need a win. Oh my God. Do you think he could be? I mean, do you love children? Uh, Couldn't you see him as your son? You know how when a dog dies and you <laughs> get a new dog and you're like, it's not the dog that I loved, but it's a new it's dog. A dog. This is the story of the changeling with Angelina Jolie. This is what it's about. Is it's, that the same movie as the older version of the movie, The no, Changeling? That's not the George C. Scott one, okay. which is about a haunted house. It's pretty good. <laughs> I thought that's where this was going. <laughs> <laughs> you see the bouncing red ball? Chicken coat murders. Uh, Moides. Moiders. Moiders. <laughs> they moided them. You know who did get moodered is the cow punchers. <laughs> the victims of the, the cow punch. The victims of the, the, the wrong gun, side eh? of the cow punch. You're the puncher of the cow. So Jones <laughs> bullies her into accepting the stranger child as her son in front of the cameras with the approving nod of Jim Tugan Davis. This is your son. In front of the cameras? Yeah. So he's like, nah, 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 take him, take him. So Mrs. Collins is not having it, obviously, obviously. W where did they get this kid from? They just like stole he, him from- He said he was Walter Collins because, oh my God, because he wanted to come to California to meet Tom Mix, the actor, the cowboy actor. That's so funny. And he heard there's a kid missing. Is my dad Tom Mix? And somebody in another state said, you looked at that Walter Collins kid. And he's like, I'm going to go to California and meet Tom Mix. I know how to get you a free trip to Los <laughs> Angeles. Basically. So Mrs. Collins obviously is not going to accept a fake son because she loves her son and her son is still missing. So she has all this evidence, dental records and fingerprints and she has all this records and the LAPD demonizes her and says, she's crazy. This is her son. So they have her committed to the psychiatric wow. wing of the LA County General Hospital. Apparently, and I, I, I can't read up on this, but I read this is where all the abused female victims of the LAPD ended up. Wow. So Gaslighting. She, gaslighting. That's the best time you use that word today because you've <laughs> used it on me two times. So she's finally released, not because they feel bad, not because what they did was wrong. They I didn't use that word on you. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they release her because there's a break in the case. By chance, break in the case. Some kid says, I almost got in a car with a guy and the chicken coop murders get caught. LAPD, their attempt to cover it up. It's another boo-boo. Oh, no. Please, Greg, we can say doo-doo, but we can't say boo-boo on this show. Call it an open wound. <laughs> it's an open wound for the public to pick up. It's so bad. It looks so bad. Captain Jones, of course, gets fired over this. So around the same time, not because of this, but kind of because they're so incompetent. City Hall gang begins to crumble. Not much, but they begin to crack and crumble. The combination starts to fall apart. 1930, criers out. Porter is elected, a reformer teetotaler, a man who couldn't be bought, but also, as we mentioned, member of the KKK. He demotes Porter, bad man, demotes Two Gun Davis to Traffic Bureau on charges of incompetence and neglect after the Collins mess. Hooray. Except after Mayor Porter, the KKK mayor. By the way, partly due to fighting Bob Schuler. All respect where respect is due to members of the KKK. <laughs> so Mayor KKK, his term is up and then comes Frank Shaw, mm -hmm. one of the worst mayors the city has ever had. Mayor Frank Shaw, most corrupted people ever. He comes and says, you know what? I like the way it was before. It oh, makes no. Two Gun Davis the chief of police again. Oh boy. 19, what year is this? 33-ish. Oh, this came up too. 1933, our old Nazi hunting pal, Leon Lewis, if you remember from that episode, Episode, uh -huh. is investigating Nazis in LA. So we talked about this before. You uh, you did a great job. Is he, uh, again, <laughs> please keep saying that. Is he the one that he went to and was like, help? And he said no? Or? I have the exact quote. I think I remember this quote. Germans could not compete economically with the Jews in Germany yeah. and had been forced to take the action they did. Yeah. The greatest danger the city faced, Davis insisted, was not from Nazis, but from the communists living in the heavily Jewish neighborhood of Boyle Heights. As mm -hmm. far as Davis was concerned, every communist was a Jew and every Jew a communist. Yeah, I remember that. That's uh, Davis. I'll never forget that. <laughs> uh, except for Slapsy Maxie. <laughs> now that's a good Jew. I like him. I like him. He's funny. So Davis, obviously awful person, right? We could just go ahead and say if he takes Hitler's side and he took Hitler's side, is okay with being like, hey, take that kid. He's your son. Because we need a win, a corrupted guy. But then we get into maybe my favorite LA true crime story. As some people who follow me historically, I moved to Chico. I got really into LA history. Mm -hmm. I started reading a lot of Raymond Chandler. We and know your origin story. After Raymond Chandler, I got really, I fell into a YouTube rabbit hole of recommended things and I landed here. And this at LA Meekly. After I read this story, I, or I heard a story, then I continue reading. All in. This is how bad Two Gun Davis is. Is his mortal enemy on this earth was perhaps the most winningest guy in LA history, and it's Clifford Clifton. No, sorry, Clifford Clinton, owner of the social nightmare, Clifton. Cliff. <laughs> a corrupt government full of swindlers and criminals and outright bastards attacking the integrity of a Clinton. That's unheard of. <laughs> funny. Political. Funny. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I did not have sexual relations with that <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> Clifford Clinton was a son of a Salvation Army captain who they were dedicated to helping the underprivileged. The Clintons were- Lock him up. Lock him up. They did missionary work in China and upon their return- <laughs> So have I. Ah, thank you. And his father opens up a soup kitchen and kids don't learn from what you tell them. They learn from what you show them. And Clifford was shown how to be kind and how to treat people with dignity. And he grows up and in 1931, his name's Clifford Clinton. I'm going to call him Clifton. It makes, <laughs> it makes me happy. More, it makes more it sense. Makes more it makes, it's succinct 
and I like it. It makes less sense that his name isn't Clifton. <laughs> I wrote down literally Clifford Clifton every time, and I know that it's not, but it felt good. Clifton opened up his first of his restaurants of a golden rule. These places, patrons could dine for free if they weren't pleased. No personal Honors, checks. No personal that's, checks. That's the golden rule. For five cents, he offered a five-course dinner, in quotes, of soup, bread, jello, and coffee. And during the height of the Depression, he served meals that either cost a penny or were for free. Mm -hmm. He really cared about people who were struggling. Comparatively, Two Gun Davis had the LAPD at the state border to block Dust Bowl migrants from entering the state. If you're wondering why the LAPD were at the California border, uh -huh. way outside of the jurisdiction until the- it was a passion uh, project. Unless, you know, the Dust Bowl migrants were sailing into Malibu. Uh, <laughs> Davis said that about his officers, they didn't need any special approval because any officer has the authority to enforce the state law. Not true. So Davis got county sheriffs at the border to deputize his officers. Some of them didn't do it and sent the officers back home. Their offer to out-of-state people looking for work or shelter in Los Angeles was, you could leave California or you could serve a 180-day jail term with hard labor. Davis promised them in prison that all you were entitled to was a Bible, beans, and abuse. That's the difference between two-gun Davis. You get to choose two of those things. <laughs> hmm. Bible and beans. <laughs> That's the name of your biography. <laughs> Bible, open up, beans portal okay. over. Me being it's like, hollowed out, yeah. And I'm praying to it. Rosary beans. <laughs> That's the difference between Two Gun Davis and Clifford Clifton. And oh, by hey, the way. He is offering him beans, just hey, like Clifton. Yeah. They offer food to underprivileged, but like one of them has to do hard labor and you can't leave. So who could possibly support Davis other than, you know, Harry Chandler and LA Chamber of Commerce, the city prosecutor's office, some public officials, railroads, the sheriff, the county department of charities and plenty of others and you know what thank you to the la times writer cecilia Rasmu rasputin rasmussen <laughs> for penning that because uh, it's a great sentiment clifton was we should also say a republican but a you know different kind of careful yeah, businessman. a different time a different time careful businessman he parlayed clifton's by the way clifton's is great it was let always it, great continues to be great yeah. even when it's closed even when it's closed on christmas and i want to make a tradition of going <laughs> on christmas because i'm a depressed person and then i go and it's not closed because it's christmas it's closed because it's monday i'm like fudge it's not closed because it's Christmas. It's closed because it's my Christmas. Cliff opened up two Cliftons, parlayed that into two hotels, a 15-room mansion in Los Feliz with tile swimming pool. Help the poor, but first backstroke. <laughs> His estate is on Los Feliz Boulevard right before it turns into Western, 5470 West Feliz Boulevard. I'm pretty sure it's still there. Clifton was a man heavily involved into the reform movement. He was an irreplaceable man with who had influence and vision, and he wanted to oust corrupt local government, meaning the mayor and the corrupt LAPD. And the underworld had paid $1.5 million to put Frank Shaw into office. And with him, he brought back Davis, as I said. So that's how it worked, basically, was that you ran Vice, that money went into campaign for crooked government officials, and then they looked the other way for the establishment. That was the that's chain. That's so weird, like a self-sustaining system. Exactly. And it's a function. It, it functions. It's a functioning thing, except everything is off. Like everything <laughs> It's working is all, well. Yeah, but... <laughs> it's all, everything's legal. And they have the cops turning the other cheek and getting uh -huh. payoffs from everybody. That's like it. So Judge Fletcher Bowers. Cows are getting punched. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what's happening. Fletcher Bowren has been recommended Clifford Clifton. Clifford did it. Clifford Clinton. And then he elects him to a 1937 grand jury to look into all of this. So Clifton wants to create a group to investigate municipal malfeasance, which is what I just described. And he has to get the blessing from Mayor Shaw, who is, I mean, he has stuff to hide, but he can't act like he has stuff to hide. So he agrees to his investigation <laughs> against the wishes of Tugan Davis, which he shouldn't have done because he's the bad guy. <laughs> so Clifton calls the group. He's assembling CIVIC, which stands for Citizens in Independent Vice Investigating Committee, and Shaw goes, oh no, I'm vice, that's me. And Wait a minute, that's not what civic stands for in general, is it? I don't think so. It's not like radar. No, it's not like okay. radar. I think it was already a word, and right. then they made a, they're like, we gotta make it work towards civic. <laughs> Go, Let's all the make words this up. word mean six words. <laughs> so, Clifton and civic, they weren't just going to take gambling joints and brothels to test, they were gonna clean up City Hall, and any remnants of the combination still existed, down with Hydra. And Shaw knows there's a big mistake agreeing to it, because he's Hydra. So he withdraws his support Ooh. for the investigation but yeah. civic is already doing the work so he agreed to it but it's already too late to stop and he wants to stop it but he can't do it <laughs> so the volunteer investigators they made a nice little list of all of vice in la 600 brothels i i did not write the number for gambling joints untold gambling joints 1800 bookie joints i see you slapsy maxi you're one of those <laughs> twenty three thousand slot machines which is so funny because like one two three the report further detailed how profits from these vices went into the finance of the campaigns of the city officials and then that went like i was saying back in to the they bent to pay off all the cops who would look the other way. The report also stated that officials from all three
three of the principal law enforcement agencies being district attorney's office, sheriff's office, and LAPD were working in harmony with the underworld. Oh, no. <laughs> it's oh, time. no. Oh, no. It's quiet, robot. So in retaliation, the LA Times attacks Clifton. So Clifton is attacking City Hall and- LA Times is attacking- And LA Times Clifton. is like, you're wrong, Clifton. Okay, great. Thanks for showing your hand. Then in October of 1937, <laughs> a bomb exploded in the basement of Clifton's Los Feliz mansion. No one was hurt. And the Clintons were on the other side of the house. So it's fine. So he called the LAPD and they were like, hey, you're probably doing it to, as a publicity stunt for Gaslighting. <laughs> gaslighting. Hard gaslighting. Hey, you're good at this. Stuff. I'm great at gaslighting. Uh, a car no, had, I'm not good at gaslighting. <laughs> a car had been seen speeding away from the house. Plates tied to LAPD intelligence division. <laughs> it's weird. I couldn't even change the plates. I know. So <laughs> I see you. I see you. No, you don't. Gaslight. It's just a car. <laughs> Red light, gaslight. So then Clifton used a private investigator who was by reputation a bad man. A former LAPD officer noted wiretaper all around grimy, cynical dude. It's said that he was the inspiration. Some places say that Raymond Chandler based Philip Marlowe a little bit off of him, but he added decency. This is a guy who could be paid for <laughs> Sanitized any- Sanitized Exactly, yeah. But basically, Harry Raymond could be paid for any job. And he knew the inner word well, so he was a good man for the job. So Harry Raymond hits hard pay dirt. Proof of payoff and meetings between the combination the LAPD and the Shaw administration. Easy peasy. But Harry Raymond doesn't take this intel to Clifton. Being a grimy dude, he blackmails his old pals at the police department and they know the perfect response. So what are the, all the bad guys up to? Well, they don't want to make it look weird. They all go out of town. Two Gun Davis and the mayor's brother Joe Shaw were in Mexico City for a 1930 international pistols match. And Frank Shaw, the mayor of Los Angeles, away in Washington, D.C. No. So to not be suspicious, they, they all, all took left. vacation yeah, at, they the all same at the same time. <laughs> January 14th, 1938. It's the morning. 955 or May Street and Boyle Heights between Whittier and 7th Street. That's where he lived. Harry Raymond walks out to his car. He steps on the starter pedal uh, and the car explodes from uh, underneath him. Monday, Tuesday. Ma Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. <laughs> the engine shoots out from the car. The windows of the neighbor's house shatter. Oh my God. The entire block is rocked. Glass and shrapnel everywhere. But Harry Raymond survives. Uh, <laughs> Old son of a gun had 186. The Terminator. <laughs> he had 186 wounds from the shrapnel and he is pissed. He's so mad. So down in Mexico, Davis gets the call that the bomb has exploded and buys a ticket back to LA. Convention's got, done. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. He thinks Raymond's dead. Mm -hmm. So he's like, oh, I better go back and deal with it. So in the meantime, Harry Raymond calls over the LA Examiner, not an Aggie Underwood, unfortunately. It's Jim Richardson, who was the editor who's covering a lot of Black Dolly stuff. And Raymond lays it all out. He implicates, <laughs> firstly, a guy named Earl Kynet, who was a commander of the LAPD Special Intelligence Section. Kynet claimed that, guess what? Raymond probably did it for publicity for his, uh, you know, cause or whatever. He probably misjudged how much explosives were in the car. <laughs> Davis gets back and he's like, oh crap, he's still alive. And then he <laughs> agrees with Kynette that eh, it's probably uh, just, you know, um, publicity, stunt. publicity stunt. But neighbors confirmed that Kynette had been seen spying on Raymond. Wiretaps were found in home. And the next morning after the explosion, the examiner puts Raymond's story on the front page. Clifton, who's not a huge fan of Harry Raymond, especially after turning over a thing, still happy to portray Harry Raymond as a crusading investigator <laughs> who, did, who he knew too much. <laughs> the trail against Kynette went underway in April of 1938 and found that Kynette ran a spy squad which wiretapped and investigated opponents to Frank Shaw, who at the time was also being recalled as the mayor and to be replaced with Fletcher Bowron, who was the judge who put Clifford Clifton in place. Bowron purged the LAPD of crooked cops and set his sights on Two Gun Davis. Davis, second time he was going to get demoted, but he was going to get fired, not arrested for some reason, fired, but he resigned in November 1938 instead of fighting for his position, mostly because his fighting would have cost him his pension, which was $300 a month. His resignation was suggested by his protege, William Parker, the man who would go oh. on to completely reform the LAPD. In 1939, Two Gun Davis took a position at Douglas Aircraft as a head of protection, but his ill health had him resign in July of 1944. He suffered a stroke in June of 1949, and then he died. Jim, Two Gun Davis, just because you're a good shot doesn't mean you're a good person. Hmm. Aww. Aww. Bad men all around. Let's remember the true hero of the story. Me for telling it. <laughs> <laughs> so much corruption. It was, it, it was so corrupt. Yeah. Police were guns for hire. Why didn't they catch Two the, guns for hire. Why didn't they catch the Black Dahlia? <laughs> Why would they? They probably did it. Let's go to the next person. This one, it's not a cop. This is a straight up criminal. Get out. A smooth criminal. So now it's a story about a guy nicknamed after a weapon that already has a nickname, <laughs> Machine Gun Walker. Oh boy. I know nothing about Machine Gun Walker. I'm glad that you don't know anything because I knew a little bit because I looked at him for something like a while back. I bet. Singles. Uh, I was Singles. all alone that one night. <laughs> I think you're going to like this story. So nice young local boy who grew up to create what the newspapers called a carnival of crime. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. William Irwin M. 
Walker. Born 1918 in Glendale, they say, but the address I found where his family lived later on was at 1013 Cordova Avenue, which is in Pasadena. So I don't know if it's a different house or maybe Pasadena used to be Glendale. I don't know. if Everything was crooked back then, yeah. even the borders. Even the streets. So his dad was an engineer for the LA County Flood Control District. So with those genes, he went to the Herbert Hoover High School and then on to Caltech, where he became very good with radios and radar. You know, it's like civic. It's one of those things. So when he graduated in 1940, he took a job doing dispatch for the Glendale Police Department and then Pearl Harbor hit. A day that will live in 1941. <laughs> a, day, a day that will always live. That's the saying. In 1942, he joined the military, but he was nearsighted, so he couldn't fight. So he just stab yeah, people. He, he was like Mr. Magoo going nuts. <laughs> but he was so good with electronics that the army took him in and he became a lieutenant in charge of a radar unit in the South Pacific. In Is this no- MASH? It's like MASH, but funny. Just get him. Take, Take that, that Donald Sutherland. In November 1944, he was sent to Late Island in the Philippines to run radar looking for enemies, incoming uh, bogeys, you might know them, Humphrey Bogarts. So <laughs> we got a whole horde of Humphreys coming in tonight. <laughs> so one night he got called back onto the ship where he was based from. And when he came back the next day, he found that there had been a surprise attack on that location at sunrise by the Japanese. And most of the men whose safety he was in charge of had been killed, including his best friend. So if he had given the order to dig foxholes that night, those men would have survived, but they called him back to the ship. So he wasn't there to have known that. So how could this be his fault? Yeah. But if that were you, of course, you'd still think it was your fault. And so did all the other soldiers Oof. who all blamed him for this incident. What? So this event got him restationed back in LA. And the only souvenir he got to bring back was a heavy case of PTSD. <laughs> so his family later said that they barely recognized this person who Jeez. came home to them. So he was changed forever and he started becoming unhinged. The first symptom of this new insanity, he had a foolproof plan to bring about world peace. All he had to do was build a death ray machine in the form of an electronic radar gun that he could aim at metal and vaporize it into powder. Uh, that will get the world to get along. I'd like to buy the world a death ray. <laughs> he didn't want to use the death ray to dominate every army in the world, though. His plan was to use it to threaten the governments of the world into raising the salaries of soldiers so high to the point that war would be too expensive to wage, thus ending all wars. That was his plan. Uh, you left out volunteers. No, you've got gotta pay soldiers <laughs> so that's the fundamental cornerstone of war that would keep the salary yeah that keeps war going every revolutionary first of all every protester is an You're actor for the money yeah now you get it now, now you get now it you, now you're seeing it <laughs> so lucky for him he had both the scientific know-how and the crazy cuckoo to try to make this happen <laughs> but he needed money and the only way he saw himself getting that was robbing and stealing Fair. but to do even that he needed weapons. So lucky for him, he was still a soldier in the U.S. Army stationed in Los Angeles. So in August 1945, he gained access to an army ordnance warehouse in town and managed to steal from it a bunch of ammo, six revolvers, 12 pistols, and seven Thompson submachine guns, a.k.a. Tommy guns, a.k.a. machine guns, Damn. a.k.a. machine gun walker. That's great. So of course, nobody noticed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be stealing. And in November of that year, he was discharged from the army, but he didn't want to move back in with his parents. <laughs> Mom, Dad, meet my girlfriend. All these Tommy guns. Meet my girlfriend. Tommy. <laughs> he wanted to be alone so he moved into an apartment at 1831 and a half North Argyle Avenue which is now under the 101 right by Capitol Records. Kind of where you got towed. You remember that? You got towed. Cost you a lot of money. <laughs> $289. Thanks for asking and bringing it up. I want to shoot you with a machine gun now. So he was also offered his old job at the Glendale Police Department, but he felt the pay was too low, so he took to his new job, stealing. They paid me pretty well. Benefits not so good. <laughs> a week after he was discharged from the army, he stole a car and changed the license plates and used that to then rob an auto repair shop to steal a bunch of tools that he would use to commit a string of over 12 robberies, holdups, and general thievery that would net him over $70,000 worth of merchandise, all accompanied by his signature Tommy gun. So he would steal cars and make fake like license plates, uh, lichen plates, so for like, werewolves. It's <laughs> uh, how we know what werewolf you are. And then he would sell those cars with new licenses. So he stole a bunch of detonating fuses that he used with some homemade nitroglycerin to blow open safes. He rented out a garage to use as a workshop for all these devious doings. But through all this, nobody got hurt. No victims. But then one day, he got a huge haul of $40,000 worth of sound and film equipment, and he needed a place to fence it. 
So he used a pseudonym of Paul C. Norris and made contact with a guy who didn't know that the equipment was stolen. And he set up a date, April 25th, 1946, to come to this guy's house at 1347 Fifth Avenue near Koreatown. But the guy started getting suspicious that this might be stolen. So he told the police. So when the day came, there were two police officers named S.W. Johnson and Colin Forbes. They were watching the house. And then Norris comes walking up. And so they approach him. And when they call out to him, he whirls around holding a Tommy gun and he shoots both of them. Oh my. (laughs) But they were injured, but they weren't killed. And they managed to shoot him in the stomach and the leg and then he ran into the sewer and escaped <laughs> so th- it was ba- it was bad but the officers he shot recovered so he still hadn't killed anyone okay cut to two months later oh, no june 5th 1946 I didn't try hard enough the first time <laughs> i think i should have used sharper bullets <laughs> june 5th 1946 the intersection of los Feliz boulevard and brunswick avenue a block away from tam o'shanter the exact details are muddled because one of the guys involved in this was trying to cover up his story and the other guy's testimonial came as he was dying and then he died so he wasn't available to that's clarify. not reliable witness yeah where is he now <laughs> he skipped down eh so either there was a high-speed chase that ended here but more likely walker was either in the process of robbing or about to rob a market on that corner. But a CHP officer named Lauren Roosevelt, he called Walker over to his car and asked to see an ID. And Walker reached into his pocket and pulled out not an ID, but a G-U-N. And he shot Roosevelt <laughs> nine times. This is my ID. There's a picture of me at the bottom of the barrel. So according Sorry, to- Sorry, he killed the cop? He shot the cop nine times. Okay. <laughs> Please, let's not go casting aspersions. He didn't kill him. He just shot him nine times at close range. So according to Walker later on, Roosevelt shot first and he dodged it and then returned fire. And then Roosevelt begged him to call an ambulance and told him, I'm not going to do that. Like he's Bartleby the Scrivener. I prefer not not to. to. (laughs) So whether or not that happened, it didn't happen. Walker escaped from the scene the only way he knew how. He ran into the sewer. Cool. Golden State Killer. The penguin. Yeah. Yeah. The penguin. So backup came on the scene and they found Walker's abandoned car filled with dynamite and his signature Tommy gun. Roosevelt was taken to a hospital and gave his story and then died shortly after. So yeah, he killed him. His last words to his wife were, I didn't have a chance, honey. Oh, Yep. Ooh. So now Machine Gun Walker is a murderer and a cop killer. So the hunt was really on, but they couldn't figure out who this guy was until Walker fell in love. Oh no. And get this, he had a girlfriend. Unfortunately for him, she was Catholic. <gasps> Bob Schuler was right. I knew it. Liars. <laughs> Bob Schuler and Two Gun Davis They're were right. Disloyal. <laughs> if you love me, you'd love that I killed a cop. Love me, love my murder. <laughs> so he bragged to her about what he did, and her being why would you, okay. her being the Catholic tattletale. You tell your loved Catholic ones everything. <laughs> she went and told her priest in confession, who of course told the police. So then the police. I'm now, not actually a priest. I'm, I'm, this is a phone booth. You're talking to the <laughs> upper. Now the police know, so they begin to hatch their trap. Finally, huh. December 20th, 1946, five LAPD officers got the key to his apartment from his landlord, surrounded the place at 2 a.m. Three of the officers enter the apartment. Marty Wynn, Earl Rambo. John Rambo. John, John Rambo. And, and a name I assume you're familiar with, Jack Donahoe, yeah, who would be name? in charge of a new case just a month later, the Black Dahlia. That's how I know him. Yeah. Wow. So these three men, they went inside, crossed over to his bedroom, opened the door, walkers crouching in the corner in the dark trying to hide before he jumps oh he jumped for a tommy gun he had on the bed before he could get it donahoe jumped on the gun and then win pistol whipped walker yeah. over the head but he still managed to get a grip on the tommy gun then win shot him in the shoulder in the back but he still didn't go down and he kept fighting like a, a movie yeah like until, the end of scarface i know and then he lost too much blood and he collapsed wow so he told the police all right now you have me do a good job oh wow <laughs> okay fair 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 <laughs> truce true truce okay <laughs> inside the apartment they found tons of ammo, 20 guns, including six Tommy guns, lots of license plates and bottles of nitroglycerin. They also found three of his stolen cars nearby, including one that had a Tommy gun mounted inside it to shoot at police through the car door if they ever got pulled over. He actually did get pulled over just a week before for a minor traffic violation on Hollywood Boulevard. And he told the cops in the ambulance on the way to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital that if those cops had made him get out of the car that day, you might have had two more dead cops to pin on me. Cool. So he also advised one of the married officers officers to get out of this business because it was too dangerous. He made his confession at the hospital, but in court he pleaded insanity but was proven to be sane. So the judge admitted that he had had a wartime experience that might be termed rugged. Might I add that he tried to come up with a death ray for world peace doesn't really help with the sanity thing. (laughs) Those are the ravings of a sane man. (laughs) A rugged wartime experience, but so did many others. They're not killing cops. So Walker insisted it was more than that and that his family had ancestral insanity, hereditary, that caught up with him 
after the war, but in April 1947, he was convicted of first-degree murder, sentenced to death. Six months later, his dad, whose nickname was Johnny Walker, drove his car to 760 West Washington Boulevard near the Rose Bowl, parked it, ran a hose from the exhaust pipe into the car, closed the windows, killed himself. Little after that, Machine Gun was diagnosed in prison with paranoid schizophrenia, but his sentence stayed, and on April 14, 1949, 36 hours before his execution, guards find him in his cell, paper bag over his head, telephone cord wrapped around his neck. Wow. He's alive, but he was unconscious. Suicide attempt. Let's reevaluate his sanity. <laughs> Turned out, no less than seven people in his family history had had to be committed to an asylum for insanity. His great-great-great-grandpa, his great-great-granduncle, his great-great-grandpa, oh his great-grandaunt, his grand-aunt, his grandma, and his grandpa, who was in a mental hospital for 32 years. Both his great-grandpa and his great-aunt committed suicide, and of course, his dad, dad. also. Oh. So with 30 minutes before his scheduled execution, it was declared he that he was driven insane by his death sentence and execution was canceled. But he was told that if he ever regained his sanity, he's going to get killed. <laughs> so with that to look forward to, he was, <laughs> he was sent off to a series of state mental hospitals where he spent his time being alone and reading chemistry books until 1959 he escaped from the oh. Atascadero State Hospital near San Luis Obispo before surrendering to a couple of quail hunters in Santa Margarita. You know we don't have badges. <laughs> you don't need no stinky badges. Just, um, I'll go, I'll go back in. Pretend all quail. From there, they sent him to the escape-proof Mendocino State Hospital slash Asylum for the Insane in Talmadge, where he received electroshock therapy until February 1961, where they decided he was once again sane enough to kill. So they sent him back to San Quentin, but he was saved again at the last minute, this time by Jerry Brown's dad, Governor Pat Brown, who granted him clemency on March 28, 1961, saying he's just going to go insane again yeah. with a death sentence. So they got it changed to life in prison. Not much happened for a whole decade after that, until yeah. 1971, he petitioned for a retrial saying that his original confession was involuntary and it should be overturned. And finally, in 1974, he was released on parole from the California Medical Facility where he was working in the chemistry lab. So now Machine Gun Walker was out free on the streets, this time 30 years older and a lot more electroshocked. He got a job as a chemist at an undisclosed location in Southern California, wow. found a wife, changed his name. Now he was happily married man Walker. He was never heard from again until he died in 1982. Wow, okay. Uh, so you can change if you get electroshock therapy after yeah. you kill a cop. Yep. His biggest legacy, though, is the movie they made of his crime spree in 1948 called He Walked by Night, which starred Jack Webb, oh, Jack who was so inspired from his experience on this movie to create his own show, Dragnet. Dragnet. Really? Yeah. So all modern crime TV shows are thanks to Machine Gun Walker. <laughs> thank you, Machine Gun yeah, Walker. Yeah, thank you for all the, the carnage. Thank you for the carnival of carnage. The carnival of carnage. Were any of these people good people that we talked about? Slapsy, None of them. Yeah, I guess, Maxie was okay. He was, he was, he was okay, a gambler. He was so, yeah. He's a gambler, okay. but he was, he like, was the best. He, he's the he was the best. <laughs> he's the best. I, I guess if you have a nickname, you're a bad guy. Yeah, good guys don't get nicknames. I was looking forward to this episode. Me too. Yeah, I'm, I, you gave me crime stuff, so why would I be upset? If you have a nickname, you're probably a criminal. You're probably a criminal or you a, might a cop. be a redneck. You, you might be a cop criminal. You know what would be really criminal? No, no, no. This is going. You don't. This isn't going where it thinks you're going. Leave a review on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was going to say Stitcher. Leave us a review on iTunes. Yes, please. Uh, We'd really appreciate it. It helps boost the the podcast. It helps boost the social cachet. It has more legitimacy with more reviews. So if you have an iPhone, just go into your podcast app, leave some uh, stars. You can leave words if you want. If yeah. not, uh, steal your parents' phone. Go right in. Do it. Yeah. Have, I don't care what you do. Well, I, I'm Daniel. Don't care, Zafrin. Do it. But yeah, leave us a review on iTunes if you can. Yeah, that would be great. We'd love that. We have have a Patreon page. People can financially support us. Financially support us to keep us going because we don't make any money off of this. Yeah. So it's good. Uh, you, for as little as a dollar a month, you can you can help keep this show going. It mm -hmm. really means a lot to us. We've, we're been sending, we've been sending out postcards to a lot of people at the $5 level. Mm -hmm. We are working on some really good merchandise yes, that's coming are. up. But yeah, support us on Patreon. There's several levels. It, yeah. uh, it's very good. Like us on Facebook. Look. Follow us on Instagram at lay underscore meekly. A lot of historic pictures and goings on. on. You can see pictures. Ah, ah, you can see pictures. Go on. <laughs> We're on Twitter. We're starting to tweet a little bit more. Ali Meekly, mm -hmm. at Ali Meekly. The main archive hub, la.meekly at tumblr.com. YouTube. Uh, all of YouTube. our episodes are on YouTube. Yeah. Feel free to ask me if I'm Greg Gonzalez from Secrets After Sex. I'll, yeah, uh, please. It's funny. Everyone has a good time. <laughs> Except Greg's self esteem. Yeah. Email us. Yes. If you have any question, comments, suggestions for episodes, or if you want to be a uh, subject of a field trip, subject of a field trip episode where we come to your uh, uh, interesting or historical place.
place in the city that you or someone you know works. Yeah. Email us, la.meekly at gmail.com. If you see us on... Uh, on AIM. Yeah, AIM. So, yeah. If you recognize our handle on LimeWire, download stuff from us. Yeah. If anyone's still on Napster, download, <laughs> <laughs> download my M&M CDs. My wrongly described M&M CDs. I know. My M&M CDs that are actually playing Vanilla Ice. <laughs> Any closing thoughts here, Greg? Um, uh, Greg, closing thoughts, Gonzalez? You I know, almost called you Greg Zafrin. That's funny. That'd be great. If we got, <laughs> you're taking my name. It's not funny. Yeah, <laughs> we've agreed a long time yeah. ago. You're taking my name. I mean, like our last name could be Gonchoin because my last letter is a Z. Yeah. And your first letter is Gazafrin. Gazafrin. I was trying to rack my brain because we we emailed people. We emailed Mike Holland and stuff about nicknames and stuff. These were just ones that I was kind of excited about. But uh, I'm trying to think of like modern nicknames for people, and it was kind of hard to jump stuff up. Yeah, there aren't a lot of nicknames anymore. There's like Brangelina. We <laughs> they were talking about can- that was the thing is that we had monikers which was not a nickname and then we had titles and we had conjoined relationship yeah. names yeah. I can't think of many people yeah, who have modern LA people but then we won't know until like 30 years and yeah. find out who's doing all these crimes <laughs> knifey Joe or this is very interesting as always I, I'm thinking like eh that can't be that much and like oh that's actually yeah. not true let's come up with a n- nickname you want to do nicknames yeah let's do nicknames for each other or for, no, 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 for LA people for LA people let's, okay. let's bring that back next time we come on the podcast next episode we'll have nicknames we'll, for have, nick- we'll have brand new nick- nicknames mm-hmm. Nipple names. Nipple names. names. Yeah. We'll make a list of people who deserve nicknames and we'll give them to them. Yeah, so, you know, prepare for that. Yeah. We'll spend all of September doing this. No, My birthday we'll su- month. We'll be doing this all month. How old are they going to be? I'm going to be 30 years old. Wow. And what what becomes five years old this year? Our podcast. Our podcast. Becomes five years old. Crazy pants. Yeah, so, you know, bur- happy birthday to everybody, really. Yeah. It's September. Celebrate. Go out and celebrate. It uh, is actually the city's birthday coming up. They're stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, have a good September, everybody. Yeah. It's not as hot anymore, hopefully. Hopefully. Well, it hasn't been hot in a while. Yeah. All right. That's that. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done, guys. Sorry. LA, we're done meekly. Yeah. That's been yet another episode of LA Meekly. Is it booze? No, you're crazy. Since 2013. We just came up with that on the spot. <laughs> we're witty. We, we're we good did, at ab-libbing. We did ab-libbing. <laughs> Want to see my ab-libs? <laughs> <laughs>